If you're like the 90% of people who can't watch a three hour video that will change your life, especially in inbound sales, you should quit now. Let's be honest. You probably want to do high ticket closing, inbound closing, high ticket sales, remote closing, whatever they call it these days. But either A, you don't have the money to buy a high ticket program or B, you don't want to pay for it. When I first started, there was like no free resources out there on this sort of stuff. And the problem is with this industry, everybody's trying to sell you stuff. They're trying to sell you their script. They're trying to get you in their inner circle, which is 14, 16, 16K. This is the problem with the industry. These gurus, the thought leaders out here, they're making it seem like education is everything. When really education is just the first step. What I did was I spent the last, man, six months just compiling everything together. I made tons of slides. And if you want to get the slides, I'll put a link below where you can just get them. No upsells, by the way. If you're not a business, I have zero to sell you. My plan is to just share the inner workings of my agency and how I've been able to blow up your favorite ClickFunnel bros offers which I hate and even people like Scott Ulford and like Vanessa Lau have asked me to build out their sales teams at one point too. By the way I'm not self-made. I've credited everyone that I've really learned from. To be honest I could probably sell this as an individual thing but my visions for this channel is just to provide zero cost education to other creators because I really am a strong believer in paying it forward. This is my personal way of giving it back and plus like you know I can make the ad sense off of this video so make sure to watch this video in its entirety so it gets spread through the algorithm. And in this masterclass, I put everything that I knew. It basically covers my full sales process. It covers objection handling. It covers the nuance of irresistible offers learned by Hormozy. It also goes over something no one ever talks about. It's the neuroscience of selling and persuasion and empowering people rather than forcing a decision out of manipulation. I'm all about, you know, being a trusted advisor, not a salesperson. Enough talking. Let's dive into it. Make sure to grab notes. Again, I'll provide all the slides and all that along with my the scripts that I use in the link below. Enjoy. Take care. Peace. What's going on? Kevin here. So one of the motivations for me actually doing this masterclass is everybody's offering like a masterclass, but it turns out to be a 45 minute pitch webinar session. I don't think that's right. So I wanted to just provide a comprehensive resource for you guys. And this is what I came up with. It's over 600 slides put a lot of time into this. Like I probably put in over, I've been thinking about this for the last two months, three months actually since the summertime. And now it's like almost spring. So a lot of thought leadership went into this. I've used this on all my actual clients, but it'll give you a sense whether you want to do inbound sales or not. And if you are a business owner, for example, you can take all these con concepts and implement it right away. So that's the goal of this. And at the end of the day, this is what I predict is gonna happen. You're either gonna take these concepts, you're gonna run with it, you're gonna get results and be like, oh my God, this resource is amazing. I'm gonna share it to all my friends, which I love by the way, and I would appreciate that. The second outcome is like, which is probably more likely gonna happen based off my experience, is gonna be like, oh crap, there is just so much out there. <laughs> like there's so much, I need help with this. and. Uh, you'll probably come to me and then we can talk about coaching arrangements and all that. But my default isn't doing that. I'm not really looking for more coaching engagements. I just want to help more and more people and sell ethically as well. So enjoy the masterclass. So this is the sell without selling masterclass. Uh, how to humanize selling by using a neuroscience based approach. One of the things I really hate about the <laughs> typical sales community is a lot of it is based on um, based on urban legends and whatnot. And a huge gap that I saw in the market was that, you know, there's not enough science. Like a lot of these things where people say buyers are liars, don't let them get off the phone or they're gonna ghost you, right? Like these things that are taught on sales floors feel kind of, I don't know, super salesy to me and feel a bit unethical at times. And so it started thinking, I started thinking, what if there was a better way? And given my science background, um, I'm a doctor of pharmacy. I'm technically Dr. Kevin Yee. <laughs> I never throw that out because I feel like it's very like, I don't know, prestigious. It's kind of weird, facetious. But anyways, I basically took my science background and um, put together a system that has worked for me. And so before we start, you're going to see a lot today. Like I said, there are like almost 600 slides in this and just experiment little by little. Keep what's useful and discard what's not helpful. This is exactly what I did when I was building this out because prior to this, I was actually a pharmacist 
And then I dove into the crazy world of sales and I had to figure things out by my own after getting burned by a guru course, which we'll talk about later. But experiment little by little. You have the recordings for all this. It's take your time. Another thing that I will say is like over time, you will find your own style. You will find the words that resonate with you. And that's the beauty of like selling and sales. It's just like martial arts or jujitsu. Everybody has their own style. They resonate towards certain things and not so much toward other things. So this is the art of selling. And then keep in mind, there's no right or wrong way. But in general, if you feel good, you're on the right path. And the science actually proves this. When we're in a survival state, we're more in a tunnel vision and we think right or wrong. But at the highest levels of performance, martial arts or any sort of craft, it's more fluid. There's a lot more options out there. And so just remember there's no right way. By the way, if you watch this masterclass, um, feel free to send a pic of your biggest insights and tag me on Instagram at Kevin the Refugee. By the way, I just did want to caution you, this is overwhelming. So my students and clients typically consume this over 12 weeks or more. So my clients I work with over a year and they're still trying to master this or I don't want to say master, but be proficient at. So it takes time. So the most important thing, if this is your first time going through this, sit back and relax. You have access to slides and recording. If you need a link, kaizenclosing.com slash masterclass. Everything we're covering is just scratching the surface. There's a lot more, including like irresistible offers, tonality of soft skills, social styles, and a lot more. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I like to do before we start is priming our executive state. So since this is a kind of a recording, I, I'm not going to have you like sit here and meditate for 10 minutes. But let's just take one clearing breath. There's science to prove it, and we'll talk about this in a bit. But we're going to do something called box breathing. So we're going to do a four second inhale, four second hold, four second exhale, and then four second hold. It's a box, literally. Anyways, let's prime our executive state. This will make it easier for you to retain the content. Think about it like this when you're in a survival state you're not interested in learning new things it's a lot harder so we want to be in a relaxed state where we can actually absorb the information so let's start with our first breath right four seconds in hold four seconds out hold Four second hold. <sighs> okay, now we're ready to start. So the first thing I always like to think of is like, what would you like to get out of today? Something I'm learning from a lot of great people like George Bryant and a lot of these people that I'm learning from is clarity and intention are the most important things that you can do for your business. And if you don't think that inbound closing or sales is a business, it really is. You need to treat it like a business and run it like a business. So what would you like to get out of today? Is it to be able to get one more conversion this week on your sales calls? Is it to feel less salesy? Is it to reduce the anxiety of sales? Or is it just to have a plan of how you're planning to have your sales conversations? Just take a second and write it down. And before we start, I'm going to be mentioning a lot of books and resources that I'll cite. All of them are over here. Um, I have affiliate links on the slide, so I would really appreciate if you use the affiliate links. It does support my vision of zero cost education to mass market. So if you'd like to support me and the authors, please consider using my links. But I, I wrote everything down here. Quick question. When you think selling sales or salesperson, what are the first things that come to mind? Well, according to a 2018 Mark Wayshack study, the most common words to describe salespeople are pushy, untrustworthy, annoying, and greedy. What's interesting is like, these are the perceptions that people have of you. And according to a more credible source of Reddit, being a salesperson at its core is manipulative and sleazy. And like I said earlier, whether it's true or not, your prospects typically make these assumptions about you before a sales call or on a sales call. Which makes me think, how did selling actually get this way? So let's take a look at 
everyday interactions, sales interactions. So we got the telemarketers. Hi, I'm calling for blah, blah, blah. Is he or she available? We used to get this a lot when I was growing up as a kid and I thought this meme was funny. Sorry, he died. <laughs> Back in the day, we used to have a lot of door-to-door -door salesmen. Literally, there's a psychology um, phenomenon called foot in the door, where like it's because of these salesmen, right? As you're closing the door, they put their foot in there and they're really uh, intrusive. Hey, hi there, I have nothing to sell you, but always got something to sell. And people used to do this with pots and pans. People used to do this with like meat trucks. People used to do this with a lot of different um, things like magazine subscriptions, you name it. People are doing door to door. And of course, the worst of these all, kids selling candy. Damn those kids with their like eyes and stuff and wanting you to uh, get type two diabetes and buy, eat their chocolate. So when I think about selling, I think about Jordan Belfort. I think about the crazy movie of Wolf of Wall Street, one of my favorite movies, by the way. But he goes out there and says, I want you to go out there. I want you ram Steve Madden stock down your client's throats till they f choke on it. It makes me wonder, why do all these interactions feel so uncomfortable? And in all these interactions, they feel unsolicited, assumptive, forceful, and manipulative. And even in traditional sales, if you've ever been taught traditional sales, like techniques like assume the close, ABC, always be closing, meaning every person that you're talking to, you're selling to. Feel felt found, you feel a bit anxious. John also felt anxious, but what they found was, that's kind of the vibe, I don't use it at all. Getting to yes, where you're using these micro commitments to get to the big yes, or keep harassing them until they die. <laughs> I literally saw these on all sales floors. And if you ever read Zig Ziglar's book, The Art of Closing, he has hundreds of closes. Uh, that are impossible to remember as much as i love zig some of zig's content yeah it is pretty hard to remember what's interesting was like because of the tactics and strategies we use the manipulative traditional tactics 50 percent of prospects think salespeople are pushy which in my opinion should be a lot higher only three percent of buyers actually trust reps so less trust ratings and they have less like this is the profession with like um that has less cre uh, credibility than polit politicians and lobbyists. That is pretty, pretty bad. I got this from Jeremy Miner, but he says modern day buyers are smarter than where they were pre-internet. So according to this Google study, 78% of consumers have spent more time researching a brand or product online than they've been searching in, in a store. So by the time they get to you, especially if you're doing inbound sales, most people know all about your company, your products, your pricing, your competitors, and how long you've been in business. They know everything about you just by doing a Google search. And the truth is modern day buyers are way smarter than pre-internet. There's a major problem in sales. Can you guess what it is? From my perception, the problem is traditional high pressure tactics trigger sales resistance, and more importantly, a survival state reaction. It's really interesting. I always, I got this, uh, this term from Jeremy Miner, and he talks about sales resistance, sales pressure. And I was like, what does that mean in biology? But it's a survival state reaction, which we'll talk about in a second. And as a result, people who have something to sell, when they're selling, um, they don't trust those people. When we think about like when we're selling, like using things like always be closing or assumptive sales, your clients probably hate you for using these traditional techniques. And guess what? You probably hate yourself for using these traditional techniques too. And so here's like five signs that you probably want to change your style. So symptom one, <clears throat> you dread the thought of taking your next sales call. If you've ever been on a sales floor, then you can understand like maybe you have an appointment coming up and you're just like, oh God, I hope this person goes. I hope this person doesn't show up so I can just have the free block. Whether a person shows up or not, um, that's one thing, but in a way, we're actually self-sabotaging ourselves. If they show up, we're self-sabotaging our mental state and all that. Imagine your energy or how much, I don't want to say conviction, but the level, we're in such a survival state that we can't actively listen and we're setting ourselves up to fail. Symptom two, you hate money conversations. So a lot of times in traditional sales, they tell you to save the price toward the end. 
But as we're going to talk about later, the longer you hold off money, the more anxious your your client gets. It feels like a roller coaster. And when you hit the top and you drop the money, you're, you just usually get that's when the objections come out. That's when people ghost you. That's when people tell you they need to think about it. And if you think about all those things I mentioned, that's a fight, flight, or freeze response in selling. And a lot of people hate those conversations because of that. So symptom number three, your anxiety shoots through the roof during the close or objection handling. Okay, maybe you're cool about money. Maybe they're like, okay, I'm cool with this price, blah, blah, blah. And um, as you're getting to the commitment, that's when things kind of get real and a lot more difficult. Symptom number four, maybe you find old school tactics like the Ben Franklin clothes very corny. I first heard about this years ago before I got into inbound selling. It's, it's kind of like this clothes where they use where it's like, hey, you know, there was a great man named Benjamin Franklin. Have you ever heard of him? Yes, I have, Kevin. <laughs> he, had, he had to make some tough decisions, right? And so... Whenever Benjamin Franklin had to make a tough decision, he would just get out a piece of paper. On the left, he would write pros. So let's write that down. And on the right, we write down uh, cons. And then your job, as a, your job as a salesperson is to have more pros and cons and just be like, look at your paper. Clearly, the answer is pros. Kind of corny. Kind of corny and kind of weird in 2023 symptom number five is everything you're doing is right according to traditional sales but nothing is working and maybe that's a sign we should switch up our style and switch up the way that we sell symptom number six you're not making more money so especially if you're performance based commission based or you only get paid on when you generate results this is a clear sign it can generate a lot of scarcity at times if you're not making any money so if you're not making any money Maybe it's a time to actually change your the way that you sell. So for me, I've been through all of these symptoms. But what do most people do when nothing is working? A lot of people respond in the following ways. So working harder. This is actually a really sad picture of me and my ex. We were actually headed to a wedding. And here I was working all the time, working on deals and all that. Oftentimes it leads to burnout and other things that we'll talk about later. Number two, people will endless, endlessly client hop or eventually quit. These are actual screenshots I took when I was managing a sales team. This is really usually the break, uh, make or break moment for a lot of new sales reps. They either decide that the, I can't think of a better word, but the juice is worth the squeeze. That is actually worth it for them to continue. Or they figure it out and they're resourceful and they, it actually works, right? but most people actually end up quitting. Sometimes they'll spend thousands on a sales guru, like <laughs> on a course, which isn't a bad thing. I've bought and learned from a lot of these people here. A lot of times like they get suckered into these guru things or they'll do massive amounts of drugs like our boy uh, Jordan Belfort here. I've seen this happen way too many times on sales floors, even experienced salespeople, people who are really, really great at what they do. I've seen them kind of blow their whole life away. Just like I've seen them hop on sales calls, either drunk or high or on drugs. This really, really happens. It's a form of escapism, which we'll talk about later. So the real question is, can these things actually help in the short term? Of course, working harder, it might get you over that bump. If you're feeling tired that day and doing a line, <laughs> that might help you. But when we look at things from a longer term um, point of view, this is actually a losing battle. So I want to tell you a story. This is actually a real story. And back when I was planning on doing a webinar, which I decided against later, I crafted this thing, but I left it in for this because I want to show you the story of what it looks like to be an actual inbound closer, right? Or an inbound closing journey. So whether you're a business owner yourself and you're hiring closers or you're a new closer, the, or if you're experienced, you probably can understand like these pivotal points. So this is Marielle. Oh man, I love Marielle. She actually quit her nine to five as a pharmacy tech and invested into a, a sales gurus course. Um, she updated her profile to fill in the blank closer. During the Dan Lock days, people would do these weird things like, I am the clarity closer. I am the 
the the xyz closer it was freaking weird and marielle thanks to me <laughs> she landed her first client right but weeks had passed and marielle is not sure why she's not getting more sales she feels like she needs to find the secret to make start making crazy money she felt frustrated comparing herself to the other sales reps and other people she followed the advice of put more reps in but it wasn't working and she wasn't sure why all these sales hacks on ig and tiktok weren't working at the time tiktok wasn't available but kind of explains the modern customer journey of someone who's getting into this industry shortly after maybe she gets her first pip due to performance and no i'm not talking about piff or in the sales world paid in full a pip is the opposite it's like a performance improvement plan <laughs> she starts shredding her next sales call she's hopping from strategy to strategy working longer hours only to burn out after time this relentless chase of trying to find the one solution to fix everything she felt lied to by the gurus and held a bit of resentment and she questioned the direction of her life and wonder if quitting the nine to five was a real big mistake after all and so at this point she was left with two choices there's the hopium where it's like oh man do i hold on to the stream uh, with like no tangible results and do i keep on going or the quetiapine <laughs> if you're in healthcare you know what drug i'm referring to it's actually seroquel or quetiapine uh, but do you just quit do you quit all hope and all that unfortunately for mariel she was like the 80 to 90 percent of people who quit i wish i had more accurate statistics but you know, even out my whole group, when we first started all together, I think only two out of 10 or 12, like actually stayed and are actually still doing this to this day. So there's a high failure rate for inbound sales. And for me, I don't even think the inbound being a closer is all that. I think the real value is being able to sell for your own business, being able to do business development work, having better relationships because you can communicate better those are the real values of uh the real benefits of something like inbound sales so the question is if you've been in this field have you ever experienced this have you ever been through this yourself can you relate or does any of this scare you if it does scare you it's a good thing at least you know what's gonna come around the horizon horizon and then you know whether you can make an educated guess whether you would like to pursue this or not now this is kevin it's uh looks very similar to me <laughs> but this is me when i was like 25. all right like mariel kevin invested in the same guru course new to inbound sales tried everything from assuming a sale to the tie downs all with very little success when i was doing this it felt very creepy honestly i didn't really like this i didn't like the aggressive assumptive sales nature of sales and i had to figure out something that actually worked for me so after investing in the guru course, I was actually on the verge of getting fired. This is my good friend, Steve. He was like, hey bud, feel free to call me a jerk. I'm looking at the numbers, but you're under a certain KPI. When I got this, my heart dropped. This was my fireball moment. This was the moment where I was like, man, I really need to figure this out or I'm screwed. But Kevin was determined to figure it out. Months later, got out of probation with my client. <laughs> I closed 1.2 million deals with my partner in uh, 10 months. I surpassed my pharmacist pay at this point, and I started outperforming people who had years, 10 plus years of sales experience. And eventually I rose to the top three of the sales boards over time. And I had multiple screenshots of this. Suddenly Kevin felt like he was actually getting the hang of this. And at this point, selling no longer felt like a chore, but felt fun, effortless, and impactful. I was doing great work, which opened up bigger opportunities like joint venture partnerships, business development roles, head of sales, these type of roles. And I started believing that selling does, is a service. It doesn't have to be sleazy. And the truth is, I know it's like being here, right? Like the valley of despair. I've been there and I've helped people through the, this, this period. And in the Valley of Despair, it's like as a coach, as a consultant, as an advisor, as a trusted advisor, 
no one can actually help you get to get out of this it's a decision that you need to make by yourself whether you want to continue or not and either way it's not a bad thing it's you don't have to like continue if you don't want to right and it's okay just intentionally just saying hey this is no longer for me i'm going to put this aside many of my friends did it and they're very successful to this day but i know it's like being here the sales gurus lied to me nothing is working and i don't know why this industry is a scam why is everybody making money but me and here's the problem with most sales advice 90 percent of the advice is anecdotal and based off of sales myths they're not based off science most of the advice goes against neuroscience and psychology it's really interesting when we look at habit change persuasion behavioral change you know a lot of times we think that we need to go head on head and that's the way to do it but in reality it's a more collaborative process for habit change that's why if you tell someone you're fat lose weight they're gonna combat against you they're gonna be like uh none of your business blah blah, blah. there's gonna be resistance if you ever been there and then most sales advice feels very shady manipulative there is kind of like a dark veil of something like they're not telling you it's really weird so it's no wonder why most click funnel offers they end within two to three years Brands have negative reviews on YouTube and Reddit, and sales teams are more burned out than ever with high turnover. I think the average, um, we have a slide on this coming up later, but the average turnaround for most sales reps is anywhere from 12 months to 18 months. It's pretty interesting. And we think about this deeper, most traditional sales tactics shut off the part of our brain called the executive state. This is our prefrontal cortex, and they trigger the survival state of both um, the, the prospect and the rep. There's a place called the amygdala in our brain, and this is responsible for the fear for fight, flight, or freeze, right? We'll talk about the neuroscience later. So today, I wanna cover the, the elements that help me rise to the top. I wanna talk about the psychology of selling, the neuroscience of selling, humanizing sales conversations. Notice I didn't say calls, I said conversations. And the fourth thing is actually objection handling, if we get a chance to get to it. But all this started with asking myself, well, what if there was a better way, a better way of selling that didn't feel sleazy? What if there was a more effective way where it felt frictionless? Ali Abdal always talks about this for YouTube. It's like, how do we move the friction? And that's something I'm always consistently thinking about. So let's talk about one, the psychology of selling. What are some everyday sales interactions that you deal with on a daily basis? Is it coffee, groceries, toothpaste? I put in the Hot Pockets because I used to love Hot Pockets when I was a kid. Now that I'm an adult, I'm just like, dude, those are so bad for you. Definitely not a healthy part of my life. But when we take a look at these commodities or necessities, especially the Hot Pockets, how did people used to buy these items in the 80s? Well, customer journey was like this. Maybe you got a pen and paper, right? You write down your grocery list, you hop in your car, you go to a grocery shop. But how do people buy things in the modern day? Um, here's a customer journey these days, amazon.com, right? They got Prime, there's the grocery uh, through Whole Foods. There's a lot of things like that. That's the problem. A lot of old school sales gurus from the 90s and older, they ignored the internet. And the truth is, if you have a bad re brand reputation or product that doesn't deliver, people know in the modern day. This is CoffeeZilla's channel. Um, he has the cult of Dan Locke. I'm probably like in fourth row in the back and stuff. And when I look at channels like CoffeeZilla, I'm not in full agreement that all courses, all programs, all that is scams are scams. There's a lot of bad programs out there, but I don't believe all of them are like that. There's a lot more nuance to that, but I do believe in calling out accountability and it's it's interesting to see the rise of these channels, the popularity of these channels. These videos wouldn't go viral if there wasn't bad fulfillment. Putting this off to the side, have you ever wondered why do people buy things? I want to ask you, how many of you been to Caesars Palace in Las Vegas? If you've been following um, recent events, there's actually the Emperor package, which is a 5 million Formula One package that will let you experience the Las Vegas Grand Prix like an emperor. 
So what's in this, uh, what's in this package? Nothing says luxury like the Nobu Villa. And when you combine the exclusive experiences we have with F1, that makes this the most sought after package for a Formula One experience. This villa is more than 10,000 square feet with a 4,700 square foot patio. You have your own dedicated omakase sushi bar. You have a dedicated billiards room. You have a dedicated media room. Chef Nobu Matsuhisa personally curating and hosting your dinner inside the Nobu Sky Villa. An in-room massage will be available to start your day or after a long night at the track. You're in the heart of the Formula One racetrack. This panoramic views that go to the very north end of the strip to the very south end of the strip. It's a five day experience. The best view of the Formula One race. So it's really interesting. You get tickets, you get a private dinner, you get a personal driver, you get a massage service. Just curious, who do you think would actually buy a package like this? This is my prediction. Someone like Mr. Beast. But why would anyone actually pay for the Emperor's package in the first place? Well, some people might be like, well, it's convenient. It's a tax write-off. Uh, it's efficient. And that's how they would justify it. So there's this concept from the book Cash Advertising. The line, nine um, learned secondary human wants. And one of them is to be informed for more information, curiosity, cleanliness of your body and surroundings, efficiency, convenience, dependability, quality, expression of beauty and style, economy and profit, or bargains. How many people buy stuff for discounts? And the book talks about how these things aren't actually what we really want. This is a facade. This is what society teaches us. Can you put these benefits in front of someone and will they buy? Yes. But here is something that is a lot more powerful. And by the way, before we go into that, let's take a look at Caesars. Oh, okay. Cleanliness, like these are probably the reasons why someone would want to buy the emperor package. But the real reason why people buy, and I mistakenly put a photo of uh, Caesar's palace over here, but okay, it might be survival or enjoyment of life, life extension, enjoyment of food and beverages, freedom of fear, pain and danger, sexual companionship. No one wants to die alone. I'm actually reading this book about how not to die alone. Comfortable living conditions, to be superior, winning, keeping up with the Joneses. This is the whole supreme uh, movement of the hype beasts and all these like expensive crazy items social approval and care and protection for loved ones we see products for these all the time and these are the real reasons why we're actually buying for something like the five million dollar package it's the enjoyment of life uh food and beverages to keep up with the joneses or to be superior and social approval. The truth is when you're on sales calls, sometimes people are just unaware of what they're looking for and why they're looking for it. But it's our responsibility to identify whether their needs are the life force eight or the nine human wants. And this is what I've noticed, and this goes for me too. Beginners will often pitch the nine human wants, the features. Trust advisors will connect the life force eight, the benefits. And while people can see a benefit, it doesn't explain why why they'll buy. So let's go a bit deeper into buying psychology. So there's this uh, book called The Secret of Selling Anything. It's a bit dated, but it was recommended by um, the go um, the author of The Go Giver, uh, Bob Berg, and he talks the human laws of nature. Number one, all individuals seek happiness. Two, happiness is relative; it's subjective. Three, the resources are limited. We only have limited time. We only have limited resources. So we can't produce everything. So it encourages trade. And when we look at this, we look at profit is increase in happiness through an exchange. Interesting. And profit is subjective, like we talked about, right? So if you're not familiar with the diagram on the right, it is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're taught about this in psychology. Whereas like, once your shelter, once your um, primal needs, basic needs are taken care of, you move up the ladder. A lot of people, when they leave college, they're looking for a job, they're looking for some money. Okay, now they got an apartment, maybe they get a house, maybe they're feeling more secure. That's when they're like, oh, 
I'm looking for more friends. I'm looking for more relationship, right? And as you go up, your needs change. And so that's why profit, if we're going by a definition before, increase in happiness, it's subjective. It could be money. It could be knowledge. It all depends who you're speaking to, right? Because if you're speaking to a multi-billionaire, someone like Elon, he probably doesn't care about the safety needs or anything like that. That's why you see a lot of these, um, these, I don't want to call them online gurus, but these thought leaders be very into spirituality and all these different things as they move up. And this is where the life force A comes into play, right? And so if we go back to Mr. Beast example, um, as in the book, he talks about as long as two individuals voluntarily enter and exchange it together, they can both profit. So for example, let's say Mr. Beast wanted to buy this $5 million package. He would um, give the 5 million in exchange for the sushi and car. In his mind, the sushi and car experience in that $5 million ticket outweighs the, the actually monetary value. But what would happen if we actually switched out the F1 car for a Toyota Camry? And instead of that rare Toro sushi, what if you switched it for the Tamago, the egg? <laughs> Which I love, by the way, nothing against it, but it leads us to our next point. No one will give up their own resources for something that they value less. So like if we're switch it out for, for the, the lemon car and the egg at that point, Mr. Beast would be like, yo, it is not the five. I value the 5 million more than the sushi and car at this point. And this brings us to our next point. Unless the other party can see that your service is in their self-interest and serves their best interests, they're not going to give up their resources for you. Here's another example, LA danger dogs. These things always come out at night after the clubs. Um, back when we used to go out in K-Town all the time, you'd see these old ladies uh, kind of cook up these hot dogs and you can smell in the air. It was beautiful. I never actually had one, but they're usually bacon wrapped. I don't really eat pork. You know, they're wrapped up and all that. And you just, there's a desire. You smell it and you're just like, man i'm really hungry i want to eat this uh la hot dog off the street and that's the offer the la street dog and they often just sell them cash only five bucks or whatever they're probably a lot more now with inflation but the value exchange here is the la street dog with the possibility of food poisoning you're valuing that experience or the five dollars in your inebriated state and from the drunk person's eyes, the hot dog is way worth more than the $5. Which brings me to the next point. It's not how much time, energy, or talent you put into your service. It's the value that the customer place, consumer places upon it that matters. So the reason why I put this was like, how do you measure whether this works or not? The degree of desire. It's whether people will pay or not. And this is where offers come into play. Offers are probably the most, by refining your offer, this is the most scalable way to increase conversions across your sales team. And if you can actually solve, um, if we're going to talk about the Alex Hormozy thing in a second, but from a drunk person's eyes, the hot dog is worth more than the $5, right? And they're willing to pay, but you're just like, okay, value, value. What is value to begin with? Funny enough, I actually met Alex Hormozzi as of like two, like last week. I ran into him at the Cosmo. I'll throw up a picture at this point. In his book, 100 Million Offers, value is broken down into four different factors. There is the dream outcome, the perceived likelihood of achievement, the time delay, and the effort and sacrifice. So in this case, the dream outcome, oh, I want a LA glizzy. <laughs> is that what the kids say? I think so. And then there's the perceived likelihood of achievement. Oh, I can smell it. It's like right there. It's not that hard to get a uh, food in my stomach right now while I'm inebriated. And then there's a time delay. Trust me, like if like most of my, I don't drink, but most of my friends who are inebriated, they probably don't want to go home, cook up a meal or anything like that. They probably don't have the capability to do that anyways. Um, but they can get it right there, right outside. So there's a convenience factor. And then the effort and sacrifice, they don't have to do any of the cooking. They don't have to do anything. It's all done for them. The level of sacrifice is just $5 for most people. And that's pretty affordable. And as we're breaking these things down, naturally there's things that we desire, but we can't produce. So um, the pro 
we can be profitable if we're able to satisfy the needs and desires of others. And the more efficient that we're at it, the bigger the profits. Don't get me wrong, these, these hot dog ladies, they make a lot of money, a lot of money because they're able to satisfy the needs and desires of, uh, of others. Which brings me to this point. This is why, I'm not sure if you recognize this area, but it's in LA, it's at the Wiltern, it's right in K-Town, I used to live right across the street from here. But this is why you'll never see LA danger dogs during the day, because there's no market, there's no, um, people aren't willing to pay at that period of time. Here's the other half to secret success. You can succeed by providing people what they want, right? So we're in the position of having to satisfy others to obtain what we want. And if we wish to trade, we have to offer the person um, he wants more than, one, than what they have already. And the point why I put this here is actually because it all starts with a really, really great offer. You can't sell anything. There's no point of inbound selling if you don't have great offers. And this is the first litmus test. Just because someone's selling th something doesn't mean that they have an amazing offer that solves a real problem for people. The problem is here too, is most people are in a survival state where they can't empathize. Like if we think about like salespeople, a lot of times they take themselves out of the position of like listening to the other person, understanding what the other person wants first, right? Most salespeople are just in a survival state half the time. And they're and in survival state, your, your empathy turns off. You can't understand their needs, the desires of other people. You can't listen because physically your brain is turned off for this. And we'll talk about survival later. I left a little tiger there just to remind myself of survival. This is a little clip of me and my friends um, out. And so when you approach any individual, make sure that you realize that they'll do what they want to do. There's a need for autonomy, which we'll talk about in a bit, but you don't judge people for what they want, their choices. We want to understand what they're actually trying to accomplish. Yo, look at these mop dits. Yo, Jason, you got stuff all over now. Classic times, good times. The TLDR of this is if you can help others unconditionally get what they want, then we're building kick-ass relationships. Relationships are at the core of all transactions or all business deals in my in my opinion. I mean Alex Hormozzi talks about this. Referrals are never ending, they're free a lot of time, and they're infinitely scalable. If I can give results for one person, they're gonna spread the word. It goes back to Life Force 8. It's care and protection of others, and that is a need. And so when you're having sales conversations, this is a new paradigm shift. It's like forget about 50-50. You want to focus on the other person's win, not in a self-sacrificial type of thing. But I think a better way to think about things is just understanding what, understanding what the other person wants first and solely focusing on that. Not saying that you commit to anything quite yet. Then you take take things back and just be like, okay, how can I provide this? Can I provide this? And then setting your boundaries from there. The reason why I love the Go-Giver is this is how I run all my accounts. This is how I do business. It's using these five laws of stratospheric success. One of my favorite books on business, George Bryant recommends it. So many people recommend it. And it's a way of not only doing sales, but also just doing cultivating really great relationships and this is a popular quote that i created relationships beat scripts revenue is a side effect of cultivating a relationship when you focus from transaction to relationship magical things happen you know whether people buy or don't buy people just remember how uh, you made them feel. This is one of my students, Marco. He messaged me back in like September. He asked me like, how much is everything? I was like, hey, you know, like I have a bunch of free resources. My minimum level of engagement is X amount of dollars. If you're tight on money, hey, just wait. There's no rush. Take your time. It's really like, I'm just being like, hey, just take your time to see if this is something that you'd like to do. He reached back out to me. It's like, I, I talked to Marco and he's like, do you remember this moment? And he's like, yeah. He just remembered how straightforward I was, transparent, and just how I served him, regardless if he was a client or not. You know, I just answered his questions and just reassured him on the next best steps. And it's like being a very, very good friend and people convert that way. Whereas most closers, they'll be like, what's a way that we can get the deal now? Don't get me wrong. Ma like maximizing revenue is important, but it's not the everything. And I think most closers are looking for a one-liner or one-call close script to magically close a deal. Which, which leads me to think, 
what happens when we focus like so i've been talking a lot about relationships but what happens when we start focusing on transactions over relationships when we prioritize the short term versus the long term well we end up old school's tactics like this this is uh george uh joe gerard how to sell anything to anybody this book came out in the 1960s and he has a great quote in the book he talks about if the prospects mentioned that they've recently been on vacation somewhere i'm going to say i've been there too because wherever that guy's been i'm going to tell him i've been even if i've never heard of the place they think they know a lot about me because i know a lot about them they think i've been to yellowstone national park they think i've fished for salmon over at traverse city michigan they think i have an aunt who lives in selfridge air force base they think those things because they've been to yellowstone national park and fish for salmon and live near selfridge field because i know about their lives they know my name and what i'm like they've heard a lot about me but the only thing they really care about is what they get for the money and uh when they buy from me they believe in me and my deals because they for sure know that i give the best deals and they are right about that which is all that matters to them and me very transactional and this is how you get commoditized because there is no trust there is no buy-in from the other party sure you might be able to provide the best deals today but what happens if someone provides a better deal tomorrow you're always in a losing place and if you are a trusted advisor um and just being very open like hey i don't provide the best deals like i don't provide the cheapest rates but what i will say is like we provide we focus on quality and making sure that they're uh that every trend every deal that we form every partnership we form is long term and is resentment free that's a powerful thing and sure will some people not buy yeah there's price shoppers everywhere but at least you can lead with integrity versus like lying to people right when people actually find out that you haven't done you weren't honoring your word how would they feel about that and the truth is it's not the 1960s anymore right People in the 60s didn't have to deal with like negative pre uh, preconceptions of sales. Like salespeople were just like, I feel like during this area of salespeople, they were very aggressive. They don't have to deal with the knowledgeable buyer and the power of the internet like we shared before. And is this way, like this leads me to a question, is this way of selling really ethical? And the truth is high pressure tactics like these trigger sales resistance but more importantly trigger survival state for everyone so does it really surprise you that most people including us like our own kind right hate salespeople? there was a study called uh, by the harvard business review where it said 48 percent of b2b people are afraid of making sales calls this is their full-time profession and they're afraid of making calls it's interesting and oftentimes people will project their beliefs on the calls too right for example Projection is a phenomena in psychology where someone displaces their feelings on to someone. So if someone, if like, I'm nervous, I'm going to project that nervous energy to you. And a lot of times we can project our beliefs on, onto people like sales is sleazy. You're a scammer. If you're taking my money, this is a lot of money for me. So it's a probably a lot of money for you. I always need to get the best deal. Really, really interesting about this. And the problem is that so many people have had negative associations with the whole selling experience too so i want to flip the question before we talk sales tactics and all that what would the experience uh, the selling experience look like if we're actually selling to a really close friend someone that we care about we have buy-in we trust that we want the best for how would it look like if we're selling to a really really close friend what if selling didn't have to be pushy untrustworthy or annoying or manipulative what if that not sales call that conversation what would that actually look like well, it might give off the vibe of this. One of my favorite people, Christo. So what does it really mean to sell? Well, it's not what you think. Selling is not pitching. It's not presenting. It's not convincing. And it's not a form of manipulation. The goal of sales is to inspire the prospect to make a decision, not to tell them what to do. You do this by helping them to think through their challenges. You don't tell, you ask. You don't tell, you ask. I love this quote by by Christo is about empowering a decision, not manipulating someone into a decision. And in the book, The Catalyst, it talks about the three stages, right? You're using tactical empathy throughout the way of the whole way, but there's a first phase of understanding. 
like understanding someone's situation and they start beginning to trust you and then there's a level it's only after they trust you where you're able to change uh they're able to change and in order for any sort of change there needs to be three different things right and there needs to be a freedom of choice a freedom of autonomy making your own decisions a need to be understood and there's a need to be consistent, intrinsic need to be consistent with our values. This is why we have the whole cognitive dissonance phenomena in, in psychology. And so no one ever grows up being like, I don't want to make my own choices. I don't want to be understood or be listened to by my partner. I don't want to be, I want to be a hypocrite when I grow up, said no one, right? And so how do we address this? How do we do this tactically? Well, now we have the neuroscience to back it up. Step two. The neuroscience of selling. As I was doing research, I noticed that a lot of things are kind of like urban myth in the sales world. And I would say this is probably the segment that kind of defines my unique style of doing things. So one of the things I kept on mentioning earlier in the call is like survival state. Have you ever wondered what causes a survival state? And what exactly is a survival state to begin with? So I, wanna, I want you to reflect what is the biggest symptom of survival state for most sales professionals? And in my opinion, if you follow the story of Marielle and even myself, burnout is a major threat for most sales professionals and businesses. There's a really interesting quote, high workloads, long hours and competing, um, competing priorities create the perfect storm of stress that is unsustainable for many reps. This was by Forbes magazine. We see a lot of this when people are kind of like full cycle. So they're doing from the prospecting to they're doing outbound, they're doing uh, outbound, they're trying to get the appointment, they're the appointment center and they're the closer too. It's a lot of work for one single person. And there's some interesting studies where in a recent study, sales professionals, two thirds, respondents reported that they're close to experiencing burnout. 57% said that their workload is more than capacity and 67% reported working more than their contracted hours. And the truth is, the threat of burnout is sales turnover. The average sales rep ten, uh, tenure, how long someone stays is for 18 months. It takes about half a year to sell, uh, fill out a good sales position. And um, most people aren't there for long term. It doesn't create the culture there and they back stay for most two years. But what does burnout look like exactly? Well, let me ask you a few questions. Do you ever feel like you're running faster but not moving any closer to your goals? Do you want to make a bigger contribution but you lack the energy? Do you feel like you're kind of like sometimes on burnout, sometimes not at burnout, and you're having those more, you're seeing those patterns? And do you ever feel like things are just way harder than they should be? And the truth is, something like burnout. This happens to the most disciplined, most focused, most engaged and motivated. And to the pe and a lot of these people, they feel very exhausted. If you talked to me just a few years ago, I would have just said, oh, I'm so exhausted. Ironically, some of us respond to the overwhelm or the exhaustion by working even harder, trying to make things up. As you notice your productivity decreasing, you want to make it up and you're working harder, which further, but it's unsustainable and it further throws you into burnout. But why does burnout happen in the first place? In my opinion, it all starts with culture. And this is the culture that most sales floor kind of is based on. Let's watch this really quick scene. See those little black boxes? They're called telephones. I'm gonna let you on a little secret about these telephones. They're not gonna dial themselves. Without you, they're just worthless hunks of plastic, like a loaded M16 without a trained Marine to pull the trigger. My killers who will not take no for an answer, who will not hang up the phone until their client either buys or f dies! I have to say that is one of my favorite scenes from Wolf of Wall Street. Really, really funny. But if you notice things, what are some common themes that you're noticing? Working harder, fight, M16s, scarcity. The truth is a lot of the sales floors and a lot of company cultures, society in general, rewards us um, and glorifies overworking and burnout as a measure of success and self-worth. And the implicit message is if we're not tired, if we're not exhausted, we're probably not doing enough. And for me, 
I know this feeling way too well. In, in, when I was born, I grew up in an immigrant family. Here's me, um, I think I had like four or something, and I was sleeping on a coffee table. In high school, I took over 11 plus AP and honor classes. I went to an accelerated doctorate of pharmacy program. Graduated pharmacy school in one piece. I secured a stable 150K um, per year job as a pharmacist and I made my parents proud as a Asian model son and I even had a YouTube uh, and blog business on the side so on the outside everything looked perfect but behind the scenes I was just falling apart I was getting burnt out from pharmacy I felt unhappy with my career and when I made the conservative effort to do entrepreneurship and inbound closing um, I was working all the damn time Right, this is literally my desk from when I was working all the time and I just couldn't stop working. And it really affected my personal life where I felt like I couldn't have a relationship because of work. work. I didn't deserve it. And the sad truth was like, I was working because I had to, not because I felt like it. When I see this photo, it brings a lot of sadness to me. I think about like, what you see is like us at Disneyland, but what you don't see is, um, you know, my ex, the person I dated at the time, planned this whole trip out for me. And I was in such a survival state that I was literally taking calls like for most of the day and even at Disneyland. And when someone spends that much time on you and you don't give them the time, it's like, is that a life worth living? The truth was, like, me and my ex ended up breaking up. And she was so patient with me at the time. She did all this sort of stuff for us. And even when we are successful with our business, because even two weeks after she ended the relationship with me, I remember hitting one of my highest weeks. I hit, like, 20,000 in one week. And I remember sitting in my apartment with my heart broken and just being like, what's the point of all this if I don't have anybody to spend it with? And over time, I started making less money and working more hours. I started hating every single call. I felt like there was no end in sight and I went through this vicious cycle. I would go through this all or nothing phase, have this incredible drive, right? But then I could only sustain it for so long. I would burn out. And because I wasn't getting things done, I felt like, overwhelmed i felt like nothing was good enough i would go through a depression and then when i was like after some period of time i would get the spark of motivation again continue the cycle it was really really vicious it wasn't until like i gained um i was suffering from insomnia i was having health issues i gained 30 pounds even though i was working out my ex-girlfriend left me for probably a good reason my mom was diagnosed with a brain tumor and I felt frustrated 24 seven and I lost my biggest client where my income went to zero and I couldn't find the energy to take on my on any more clients where, you know, these effects, like I realized I had to make a change. I had to do something different. And this was me going through it at the time. And some of the mistakes I made was like treating that burnout was a badge of honor when it really wasn't doubling down on effort, even though I was seeing reduced efforts, making the mistake or coming to a conclusion of like pushing harder um, for better results. But the truth is that it was only true to a certain point. And it goes to the point of like something we think about is like the diminishing returns, but we don't think about the negative returns of our work, right? And so we have this like sharp, productive phase where things hard work is actually correlating to the results or output we start hitting diminishing results where it's not as drastic as before but then there's a point where working harder is actually putting us over the edge where we're seeing negative returns and when i reflect back on these moments it was rarely because i didn't try hard enough and i think it's like looking back it's often i was trying too hard I was making things very unsustainable for me not only in my inbound sales business but or advisory but also in my um, my personal life and my YouTube channel. And as a result, I was just making things way harder than they should have been. But everything started changing when I started asking myself better questions. 
Around this time when my mom was diagnosed with her brain tumor and I was broken up with my ex, my good friend Dr. Eugene Choi reached out to me. This guy, he actually uh, is also a pharmacist too. We applied for the same job. He got the job, I didn't. Still hold this grudge to this day. But he's a pharmacist and transitioned to neurohacking coaching. And he, at the time, was just a really, really great friend to me. He helped other six and uh, six to eight figure entrepreneurs just feel a lot better. And he helped me ask like a lot better questions. I started thinking, well, what if I took the opposite approach? Instead of pushing myself to the limit and sometimes past my limit, what if there was an easier or better path? And what I'm about to share with you is like the number one thing that changed my business and personal life. After applying this knowledge, I started feeling better. I started making way more money. I fired all my clients from hell, right? Like my nightmare clients who would used to blast me at two in the morning. My work didn't feel like work anymore. It started being a lot more fun. I had more creative ideas. Opportunities such as business ventures and coaching started coming into play. I started making more money passively. I started traveling more, seeing my friends and family, and I had more time to dedicate to things like jujitsu. All my students know that like I can't stop talking about jujitsu half the time. TLDR, I just felt happy for once in my life, and I was getting more done while doing like less, actually. And so the question is, is what if you could avoid all the mistakes that I made and work smarter, not harder? What if you could perform better without sacrificing blood, sweat, and years? What if we, instead of pushing ourselves past our limit, found an easier path. So what is the secret that I'm talking about? This is what Eugene taught me and I'm going to teach you my interpretation of it. So something to keep in mind, there's only two states your brain is ever in. It's either survival state or executive state. And the funny thing about these states is that you, can, you can't be in both at the same time. It's either one or the other. So the real question is, how do you know which state that you're in? This is a chart of survival, stress, anxiety, overwhelm, anger. Executive state is hope, gratitude, compassion. Gratitude is a huge one, which we'll, we can talk about later. Curiosity is a huge one. But here's a cheat sheet, because no one likes to memorize a long list of things. I didn't like doing it in pharmacy when I was learning my top 100 and stuff, drugs and all that. But the cheat sheet is feel good, it's probably executive state. Feel bad, it's probably a survival state. So let's talk about each of these states. So the survival state, and keep in mind, none of these states are good or bad. They're just protection mechanisms for us and they serve different purposes. The problem is, is if we stay in survival state too long, it's not meant to be long-term. So let, let's break down what survival state is first. So this is this keeps you in fight, flight, or freeze mode. We'll break down what each one is, but fight, is like imagine if a tiger is in the woods and stuff and it's trying to hunt you down well one of your things might be let's fight against the tiger let's flee let's run away and the freeze is kind of like playing dead like a possum when we see a threat physical threat or maybe we're triggered by a emotional past or belief it activates this area called the amygdala which is the fear center and so this actually turns off our thinking and you're reactive. So when people do like crazy things in survival mode and you're asking like, hey, what were you thinking? They literally can't think in that mode. Most of the adults stay here for over 70% of their, their life. If you ever heard that quote about like, you only use like 10 to 20% of your brain throughout your, like while you're awake, it refers to this because look at the amygdala, it's such a small area of the brain, but the prefrontal cortex, which is the top layer, right? It's a huge mass of our brain. And when I think about survival state, it's a self-protective state. You're focusing on yourself. You're focusing on protecting yourself. You're um, just staying alive, right? So you don't have the capacity to empathize, listen, understand. You worry about things. Most common trigger for survival state is probably something like money, which we'll talk about later. Let's dive into the different the responses. So there's the fight response. The first person I think of is Conor McGregor right back in the ufc days he'd puff up his chest he'll overcompensate and it's like the fear of not being valued or good enough and typically fight responses happen when you get defensive because something hurt or offended you and some common symptoms in the workplace too are like maybe you're not gonna fight your coworker, but it's like working harder fighting for accomplishment pretty much my response to like feeling not good enough let's talk about the second one flight response so if you guys know who this is on the right, think about 
Tiger Woods. A few years ago, he was caught like cheating on his uh, wife. There was a famous uh, news article story where he actually drove off and crashed his car because he was in flight mode. So oftentimes, a flight response is avoiding a problem you're afraid of and um, the difficulty with the confrontation. Sometimes it looks like procrastination when you need to do something, but you're trying to do something else. You can also flee from the problem by doing things like Netflix binging, indulging in sex and alcohol, ice cream binging. A lot of the times we numb ourselves through social media, right? We'll binge content, YouTube content. I do this a lot myself. All right, so let's talk about the last one, the freeze response. Oftentimes it means playing dead or doing nothing. And it happens when we feel overwhelmed with a lot of decisions that are thrown your way. Whether you like them or not, this is Joe Biden. This was like a town hall with um, CNN, I think. And when he's asked in a town hall about like how, why he suddenly left Afghanistan, right? Joe Biden was doing this weird position and then all these memes started coming up. So this is what I think of when a freeze response is, uh, happens. So maybe getting caught in a lie, freezing, and hoping that the problem might go away. So in sales, it might look like I need to think about it. Which brings me to the next point. What are some survival reactions that your prospect might have in a sales call? Well, it might be a fight. So attacking you or arguing you with objections. Flight, is it ghosting you? Freeze. I need to think about it. This also happens in dating a lot, unfortunately, right? And when, and this often happens when you kind of corner someone into making a decision right there and then. It can trigger a survival state. And most of the deals that are done this way in traditional sales are trying to activate a fight response, right? Of like, oh, let's do this, right? Let's make this work out. But what happens? A lot of times when we make decisions based out of survival, we end up in a situation of resentment, and that's something that is never great, especially if uh, you're trying to reduce chargebacks, refunds, any sort of things like this. So my question to you is, what are some survival reactions that you might have in the sales call? It might be fighting, so trying to push or hard close the deal, especially when someone's like, I need to think about it. Now they're triggering your survival state, and now you're going, you're going through this fighting match anymore. Now, it's not, Suddenly, it's not collaborative, it's combative, which is great for things like jujitsu, but not for sale, selling or long term partnerships. There is a flight response, so maybe dreading your next sales call, drinking on the job, dr doing drugs like we talked about earlier. Maybe there's a freeze response, not responding to a proposal, delaying things, delaying things, delaying things. And the interesting about survival state is like when you're in survival state, you literally can't think, you're just focused on the short term. So let's talk about the other side. Let's talk about the executive state. So the executive state is actually a lot bigger than this, but it requires, it's the prefrontal cortex. It activates, this is the center that's responsible for creativity, inspiration, energy, intu intuition, intelligent thoughts and ideas, creative ideas, especially. Typically, this is what you'd want in your life, um, <laughs> especially in partnerships and, and all that. And um, the biggest thing is it turns on creative thinking, creative problem solving, and an empathetic state. You're more listen, you're more open to listening to someone. Some other functions is critical thinking, as we talked about before. Focus. When you can't focus, you're probably not in an executive state because there's this whole concept of flow state too, and that's when your executive state is turned on. Empathy, ability to make good decisions. If we follow the literature about like a lot of these self-development, you might hear things, common themes from Car uh, Carol Dweck, like a fixed versus growth mindset, scarcity mindset versus abundant mindset, victim mindset versus ownership mindset, selfish versus selfless mindset. So for example, a go-giving mentality is an executive state, your selfless mindset, ownership mindset. When someone is uh, in a survival mindset, they're just like blaming you constantly. So let's say if a customer buys from you and it doesn't work, they blame you automatically. They're probably in a survival um, thing versus a uh, executive state now that you see all these correlations between like different thought leaders they're all talking about the same thing how do we activate this area in our brain but i think even before that it's like how do you know what state you're in how do you know if you're in an executive state well you might have those aha moments quite a bit 
there's this really great forum um or sorry subreddit um called shower thoughts and it talks about all the thoughts that people have in the shower or just random moments of the day and it's like these aha moments where you like solve a difficult problem that's an example of an executive state there's a flow state too where you lose track of your body you lose track of place you lose track of time have you ever been in an activity for me it's like jujitsu a lot of time where you look at the clock and you're like oh my god like literally like an hour or two just passed by where did time go maybe you suddenly have clarity about the direction that you're going in life this is why like spending time alone mindfulness like you know when you're finding your purpose you can't find it if you're busy all the time you need to sit down and just let your brain work and turn on that part of your brain that's why like people who are in survival can't find their passion and then the deep pers personal connection with a loved one this one is huge right when you're in love like typically you're in executive state because you're no longer in a survival state you're no longer in a self-preservation state you don't feel alone and the key to providing to to a powerful living experience is tapping into the executive state and turning off the survival state. A great quote about how this works is like, think about a computer. When um, a computer slows down, it gets cluttered. While it still works, it becomes less free to do essential functions. And so when you are in a survival state, your brain is cluttered with like assumptions, negative emotions, toxic thought patterns, right? And then you have less energy to perform what's essential. If we think about it, a survival state is very energy depleting. That's why people who are burnt out lack energy because you're in a state where, you know, it triggers this cascade. You get an adrenaline dump, your increased stress, increases cortisol, increases your blood sugar, right? Increases insulin and all that. So you're getting like in, in like you're getting huge fluctuations of your blood sugar right there which can lead to potentially like diabetes, high blood pressure. When you're when there's more glucose in your blood, what we typically see for diabetics is a higher blood pressure too. It's really interesting because this is where our own thoughts and beliefs can actually trigger our survival state. And it can actually trigger our health according to people like Joe Dispenza. Stress can we've heard the term stress kills. But this is kind of how it works. And so what's really interesting is Joe Dispenza actually has this model where he ta walks us through how our thoughts and beliefs can tr trigger our survival state and have physical, uh, physiological effects on us. Joe Dispenza, he says, thoughts are the language of the brain. Feelings are the, are the language of the body. So what's really interesting is that feelings sometimes can trigger this cascade or thoughts can trigger the cascade. It goes both ways. And he talks about how our external environment is made up of people and things at different times and places. So for example, if we're around people who love working out, who love doing jujitsu, we have a higher chance to change the thoughts and the experiences that we have. That's why people say environment is so important. And then Joe also talks about, we have the choice, and this is the power of autonomy that we were talking about earlier, but we have the choice to either, you know, relive the past that is familiar to us or relive the future self that we want to be. And so how does this relate to sales? Well, like a lot of people have really bad experiences to sales. So like their thought might be like, as a sales professional, our thought might be like sales is a number game. Our choice is like, I'll power, I'll power dial my whole day until someone picks up. When someone picks up, it's my one chance. So I'll push the sale until they hang up. Because I'm using high pressure uh, tactics, I might be going through the experience of getting ghosted or getting a lot of BS objections or I need to think about it. And the feelings is like, I feel really burnt out and frustrated, but numbers is a sales game and it continues and it reinforces over time. That's why like with sometimes older people, you see people stuck in these cognitive loops over and over again, right? Because they're going through these things and that's all they know. And it's like so reinforced in their head. For prospects, it might be like, I don't trust salespeople. Or, and the choice might be, I'm just gonna get what I need on the phone, just figure out like get information, just get off. So what do they do? They say all the right things to kind of lead you down, get the information that you need. And then the experience, the salesperson keeps on pushing the sale and using sleazy tactics. And then as a result, I feel attacked and harnessed or, or harassed, which reinforces the belief that I don't trust salespeople. And a really interesting thing is the most important decision we can make 
is whether we believe in a, we live in a friendly or hostile universe. It's really interesting. We have this area called the reticular activating system and it filters. This is where confirmation bias comes into play. If we believe that we have a crappy day, we'll look for all the things that really bother us. Oh, like my coffee order was wrong. Maybe I was stuck in traffic. Life sucks. This girl doesn't like me. But then we can look at it the other way, right? It's like, okay, you know, friendly universe. Oh, maybe I'm getting stuck in traffic. You know what? I get to listen to a really great podcast. Oh, it wasn't the coffee I wanted, but it was something new that I got to try and I found out I really like this. Maybe that girl like that wouldn't go on a date with me. She's actually for the streets and it opens up something new. This is where a lot of people get into spirituality because we're naturally built this way to not feel alone and, and it helps us act whether it's true or not the thing is we can use this to activate our executive state and reap the benefits of it if you ever wonder why things like self-care therapy and meditation are so important because this is where we stop we reflect and we shift out of the survival state into the executive state by thinking by taking this the time to just physiologically control our breathing to really think and reflect and we can manipulate it that way which brings into a question like okay executive state survival state kind of esoteric kind of like woo woo a bit pseudoscience right so how do you actually measure it well a lot of people um known about these states throughout history but now we have the science to prove it so we're going to talk about different tactics right now on how to activate our, exec our executive state and how to measure it in a bit so the first thing is noticing the emotions around you so the action is like making a daily practice to label your emotions there's actually a really really great study done at ucla and it was about uh, arachnophobia so people who are scared of spiders and stuff they basically took a bunch of people and uh, exposed them to spiders and what they realized is that the people who labeled their emotions acknowledge how they felt actually experienced less anxiety than the people that did it's kind of interesting right so if you've ever been in therapy they'll always talk to you about like how you feel and so this is the process you label your emotion. Part of me feels a bit sad. This activates your prefrontal cortex because you're like, oh, why am I sad? And your thinking turns on. We can literally turn this on at will just through labeling our emotion and bringing us down that cascade. It takes a level of self-awareness to notice your feelings, which is really interesting because if we don't check the way that we speak our, to ourselves or notice the way that we speak ourselves, right? We can end up in these loops. And so what's the difference between saying something like I feel sad versus I am sad? Well, the difference is I am sad as a permanent identity. I feel sad as a, a temporary state. And so what happens a lot of times people will just say, I feel sad. I feel sad. I feel sad. And then one day they're going to say like, I am sad. And they associate with that identity. There's a really great book by Pema Chodron. She says, uh, it's the book is like when things fall apart, but you'll see a lot of these people say, you are not your thoughts, you are not your feelings. So it's interesting when you are speaking to clients, right? You can notice certain language. I'm broke. Hmm. Interesting. I feel broke. That's a different identity. The long story is labeling can reduce anxiety and other survival responses and can help people shift into their executive state just by thinking about how they feel. And what's really interesting, according to Chris Voss, he talks about labeling. Uh, labeling is validating someone's emotion by acknowledging it. So using words it sounds like, it feels like, it looks like. And from that, from a neuroscience view, how would that influence your counterpart's state? The whole thing about labels is clarification, even if we're wrong. So I might say to someone, hey, it seems like you're a bit frustrated. It's like, no, I'm really frustrated. Technically, I was wrong with my label. I said a bit. But now they, it opens up the space for them to really talk about how they feel. Step two, learn the physical sensations with each state. So this is what I talked about earlier. Survival state is the sympathetic nervous system kicking out. It prepares a fight, flight, or freeze response from any danger. But the pair, the executive state is our rest and digest, relaxed state. It inhibits the body from overworking and restores the body to a calm and calm, a composed state. And like I said, and like I said, just like when you're working out or like high stress environments, it's okay to be in survival state for a short amount of time. But you gotta learn how to wind down. The problem is a lot of salespeople, a lot of florists, they don't do this. 
So the executive state is where we're supposed to be majority of the time. And so if we look, we can literally observe like a lot of different things, right? For example, what I was talking about with the sympathetic, we can get the adrenal dump, right? Of like adrenaline and all these stress hormones and cortisol, which can affect our blood sugar and all these different things, right? And then oftentimes when we're in fight or flight mode, we don't get the best like digestion all the time and all these things, right? So it's important to be able to go in between the two a lot. But how do we actually know if we're in a survival state or executive state? Well, we can do something like measure brain waves through an EEG, electroencephalogram. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong. But there's different waves. There's beta waves, alpha waves, delta waves, theta waves. And so let's break this down for a second. In beta, our attention is focused on the outer world, including our body, space, and time. And there's different levels to beta, right? Like all of us are probably in beta right now, probably low beta because we're thinking. We're thinking, but when you think high beta, we think survival. It's usually a aroused or stressed state. So we're going through aggression, fear, anxiety, pain, suffering. This is where overthinking can happen, um, over-focusing, tunnel vision. People usually get stuck in the state. When people get stuck in the state, they need something external to change their inner emotional state. So things like drugs, alcohol, TV, things like that. Okay, so that's high beta, but how about mid beta, right? Well, have you ever had to be in a high performance kind of mindset, right? So I think like healthy competition, like a jujitsu competition or something like that. And this is happens when your brain is more amped up and it happens like right before you deliver a lecture or performance. The way I think of it is like good stress and you can channel this uh, into action and then you relax because when you're competing, you're not going to be in like full flight or fight mode the whole time. It's more of uh, you, you're able to turn it off. And then there's low beta, which is like, I like to think about learning. So you're aware that you're in an environment in your home, maybe in a coffee shop watching this. And um, your brain is just actively integrating the sensory information from the outer world to your brain and body. So as you can tell, we can like, we're slowing down everything, right? Okay, but how about alpha and beta, uh, theta? So in alpha and theta, I think flow state. So think creative state. This is the resting state that allows us to dream or imagine more creatively in pictures and images. The way I like to think about it is like daydreaming, right? And we become less analytical and we move beyond the thinking mind. We start being a lot more creative. And then theta is like that state where you're not asleep, but you're not fully awake. I like to think meditative state. Oftentimes for me, I like I get in the state when I'm in like getting a massage or like I'm meditating obviously, but it's a very hypnotic state. This is where hypnotherapy comes into play, where we're more open to information, more suggestible. We can lose track of body, space, and time. And theoretically, we can reprogram our subconscious and beliefs. So this is where we can re, uh, reprogram our money beliefs and a lot of the things that we uh, actually struggle with as well. But here's the problem. A lot of us don't have access to an EEG machine. So what's a more practical solution? We have something called heart rate variability. It's one of the reasons why I wear all these things on my wrist to kind of track my HRV. And basically it sees how often we shift from survival state to executive state or the parasympathetic to sympathetic nervous system. And we can measure our HRV. So in general, um, a low HRV means that we're probably stuck in one state. And so we're probably in a survival state. A high HRV is high adaptability so we have um we're probably switching back and forth from executive state all the time which is a really really good thing there is uh, some controversy about like whether this actually works but um from my experience it's uh, really um it's not a you're not trying to hit a certain number it's all relative like these are relative like measures and stuff like that so how do you measure it well like i said you have trackers so you have the aura ring the Muse headband, um, which I use for meditation and the bio strap. These tools are kind of expensive. They're not a need to have, but they're just nice to have, honestly, when you're starting. And basically the TLDR version is like the higher HRV, the more relaxed you are. The lower HRV, the more stressed you are. So the action is you need to activate your parasympathetic nervous system by doing breathing exercises. And so what we did in the beginning was box breathing. 
I was trying to prime us for executive state. Typically, I'll do it for five to 10 minutes before a high performance thing. Navy SEALs actually utilize this strategy too. Sometimes I do a longer ex eight second exhale and that'll get you in a more relaxed state. When we are doing jujitsu or even on a sales call, learning how to breathe is the most important thing because you can think more creatively. You can think more on your feet. You're not reacting to things as well, right? You can take a pause. So step number three, paying attention to nonverbal expressions. This is a really funny thing from Squid Game. Uh, Squid Game. So what's really interesting is that you can notice how someone is actually by their non-verbals. For example, have you ever seen those fake smiles where people are like, versus like <laughs> that? There's a big difference. What happened? My eyes actually crinkled and it's like these subtle micro expressions that, that can communicate so much. As a YouTuber, I see this a lot where micro expressions say everything. There's a guy named Better Ideas. He has this very similar expressions of the face, not too expressive, but they communicate a lot um, just through those micro expressions. What's really interesting about this is that Chris Voss actually talks about how um, a large percentage it goes into understanding someone's body language first, their tonality second, and then their uh, what they're saying next. So <clears throat> sometimes you'll notice these patterns, right? It's like, hey, I noticed that you said yes, but it seemed like there was a bit of hesitation. Uh, what's on your mind? Right, you're able to kind of bridge those disconnects to encourage a conversation out of it. It's really beautiful. And then the last step is asking questions based on curiosity. And remember, I, I was highlighting curiosity as one of the executive state functions. And so something I like to do is ask myself, is the way that I'm speaking out of curiosity or concern, am I trying to lead them down a pathway or am I asking based because I'm genuinely interested. I'm genuinely curious. An interesting um, observation is like, you know, according to Chris Voss, he says, start every question with how, sometimes what, and rarely why. And there's strategic moments to this. When we ask why questions, a lot of times it can trigger our, like our childhood survival type of things. When I think like, why did you do this? I think about like my parent yelling at me. When I think how, is how is kind of like the the language of the executive state so how are you feeling how would that look like but if you're using a how question for someone in survival like you know i just can't make rent well how do you feel sounds kind of weird so that's where what questions come into play what is the translator between the why which is a survival state based question and the how which is the executive state question we can use words like well what would happen if we could find a solution to that what if we could do xyz for you by using the right questions we can encourage people to think and this is how survival this is how executive state is activated um some other ways to trigger people's executive survival state too is like did you do this why didn't you you always never this is how you can identify if someone is survival state. So it's not only important for us to notice our own language, but it's important to notice our counterparts language. I noticed this on certain sales teams, people that I've had to manage and they're, they're talking in absolutes. They're making accusations. They're putting blame, but it's funny. As soon as I'm like, well, I, I hear you. Do you have any potential solutions for any of these concerns that you have? crickets and that's how i know that they're in survival really really interesting how communication is like that and basically the tldr behind this is this is where soft skills come into play you need to be able to recognize these things and communication is just very very complicated in general there's this great um slide that i took from melanie whitney she talks about mindful communication and she talks about how complicated communication is you have the message that you're sending out to the to person to the other person right but then there's the channel. We're probably using Zoom. Sometimes the internet is like very choppy. That's the noise, right? And then the other person needs to like take in the message of decoding. And then there's a feedback, there's communication there. But then like on the, in my background, there might be kids running in the back. Maybe the lawn uh, guy is like, the lawn keeper is like, I don't know, leaf blowing or something. There's stuff going on. So it's important to kind of address those issues as they come up. For example, if I'm on a sales call and I see, I hear a lot of screaming in the back, I'm like, hey, I noticed that the, 
It seems like there's like something going on in the background. Did you want to take care of that? Did you want to reschedule? How would you like to proceed from here? Right? Something like that. It doesn't have to be as formal, but it's addressing those things. That's part of communication. So let's go back to everything. The whole point of me talking about communication is that high pressure sales tactics reduce like trigger survival state and selling in general, traditional selling, especially triggers it because it feels sleazy might feel a bit of um, discomfort because of the rejection of your prospect. You might be afraid to ask for the order and commitment, right? And we can trigger our survival, our prospect survival state if we're using these high pressure tactics on people. And so the secret to authentic selling or selling without selling is avoiding those triggering the survival state while activating the executive state for both you and your prospect. And then the beautiful happens, which I alluded to earlier, selling suddenly becomes collaborative rather than combative. And then as a result, we start listening versus telling people what to do. We start asking instead of assuming. We start labeling versus like avoiding emotions. And this happens with money especially, right? And when we do this, we can truly understand our prospect situation. We can collaborate toward a proactive solution versus reactive solution. And a real relationship is based on trust uh, that we can form. So after we do this, how do we get tactical? How do we know what questions to ask? And this is the third part, humanizing sales conversations. All right, so by now we've covered a lot of the neuroscience, the psychology. How do we actually bring this into practical use? And this comes into step three, humanizing conversations. So before we begin, what is the difference between old school and modern day selling? We alluded to it a little bit before, but let's highlight some popular movie scenes. We're a new company with a new name, a company that our clients can trust. First, we pitch them Disney, AT&T, IBM, blue chip stocks exclusively. Once we've suckered them in, we unload the dog <laughs> where we make the money. 50% commission, baby. Oh. And you wait, you wait. And whoever speaks first, loses I, I appreciate the call i really have to give this some thought and uh talk to my wife about it um can i call you back they don't know right they gotta think about it they gotta talk to the wives or the tooth fairy point is it doesn't matter what the they say the only real objection that they have is that they don't trust you guys why should they trust you i mean look at you you're a bunch of sleazy salesmen right what do you say you mean to tell me that if i put you in at union carbide at a seven it took you out at 32 texas instruments at 11 and took you out at 47 u.s steel at 16 took you out at 41. You wouldn't be saying to me right now, Chester, pick me up a few thousand shares of Disney on the spot right now. Come on. I mean, I, seriously? I, I don't know you. You you cold called me. You're a total stranger. I have a complete agreement with you. You don't know me. So I don't just know take a you. moment to introduce myself to you. My name is Alton Kupferberg. Bobby Feinberg. Chester Meng. I'm senior vice president at Stratton Oakmont. And I plan on being one of the top brokers of my firm next year. And I'm not going to get there by being wrong, right, Stan. You sound like a pretty sincere guy. You feel comfortable with me now, Scott? You give me one shot here. And believe me, Kevin, the only problem <laughs> you're going to have is that you didn't buy more. Sound fair enough? <sighs> Shit, my, my, uh, <laughs> my wife might divorce me, but yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite scenes, <laughs> again. But what do we notice? There's a lot of smooth talking. There's a lot of assumptive closing. Let's try 8K. So you're telling me if I got you in at XYZ and got you out at XYZ, you're telling me? And then there's the legendary F you at the end, which is really, really funny. So let's take a look at this popular movie, Boiler Room. Hello? Hi, Mr. Davis. This is Ron calling you from the Daily News. How you doing this morning? It's Davis, and I'm not interested. Okay, I'm sorry to bother you. Have a nice day. Wait a minute. Wait, you consider that a sales call? If you guys want to close me, you should sell me. All right. Start again. Hi, this is Ron from the Daily News. How are you doing this morning? What do you want? It's not what I want, sir. It's what you want. Now we're talking. All right, what are you selling me? I'm offering you a subscription to the Daily News at a substantially reduced price. So tell me, why should I buy your paper? I'm but the Daily News offers you something no other paper can. A real taste of New York. More photographs than any other daily in New York. And we have the most reliable delivery in the city. I think that was a sales call. Good job, buddy. So you're going to buy a subscription? No, I already get the times. What's really interesting about this scene is that there... So there's a few interesting things from this scene. There's a focus on the pitch. That's your pitch? You gotta sell me. People-pleasing. It's not what I want. It's what you want. 
Focus on convincing? Why should I buy your paper? Focus on features. Remember what we talked about the light force eight and the nine human secondary wants. And focus on closing every single deal. So you're gonna buy? And then let's just take this one last scene from the boiler room too on traditional sales. Move around, motion creates emotion. I remember one time I had this guy call me up, wanted to pitch me, right? So I let him. I got every rebuttal out of this guy. Kept him on the phone for an hour and a half. Towards the end, I started asking him buying questions. Like, what's the firm minimum? That's a buying question. Right there, that guy's gotta take me down. I was giving him a run, and he blew it. You have to be closing all the time. And be aggressive, learn how to push. Ask him rhetorical questions, doesn't matter, anything. Just get a yes out of him. If you're drowning and I throw you a life jacket, would you grab it? Yes, good. Pick up 200 shares. I won't let you down. If you can't learn how to close, you better start thinking about another career. Somebody tells you that they got money problems about buying 200 shares is lying to you. There is no such thing as a no-sale call. A sale is made on every call you make. Either you sell the client some stock or he sells you on a reason he can't. The only question is who's gonna close, you or him. Uh, be relentless. That's it, I'm done. Some interesting things to notice is like it's very combative. And we hear these things being taught on sales floors. Focus on the high energy. Motion creates emotion. What does that mean exactly? Focus on the pitch. So I let him pitch me. Always be closing. He had to take me down. Be aggressive. Learn how to push. Ask questions. Get a yes out of them. The micro commitments. Have your rebuttals ready. It's not saying this is wrong, right? But saying like, is asking, is there a better way? And if we're focusing on being aggressive in this fighting attitude, right? And having rebuttals ready. Is that fostering a collaborative or combative experience. Something that a lot of salespeople don't think about is the back-end fulfillment. They might not care, but it does bleed down to the sales floor. Remember why I talked about brand recognition, reputation, I meant. People these days talk about this and they talk about the experience that they go even through the sales call. And it's something that I would like to ask is, does anybody else feel the gun to your head vibes? I do. Oftentimes it can feel like a first date, like when you're selling. And how would you feel if your day opened up with this on the first thing? Or maybe you opened up with this. So your place and mine, it's kind of weird. Just like when sales, sometimes people with dating might just go along with it. But more often than not, if you hyper-focus on the deal, it tr triggers a survival reaction. It's transactional. People will lie to you to get out of the situation. They'll attack or kick you in the balls, or they'll freeze up in shock. And remember, Using high pressure sales tactics triggers sales resistance in a survival state. So this is the difference between survival and executive state, right? Like I don't have the funding for this versus I'm resourceful enough to figure this out. What if I lose money? I can always make more money. What is this going to cost me now? What is the opportunity cost? What are you going to do for me? How can this benefit both of us? And notice, like, we talked about all these different states of the victim versus ownership mindset. And especially in inbound sales, the primary trigger of sales resistance or, like, survival state is your prospect not feeling understood. Remember those three needs that we talked about? The need to be understood, the need to make your own decisions, the need to be consistent with your values. Otherwise, it builds internal conflict. And according to Jeremy Miner, here's the difference that he perceives old school selling versus modern day selling, where so much was spent on presentation and closing. This is the amount of time that you spend, right? And it's very little discovery. Whereas modern day selling, most of the engagement is all building trust and, and, uh, and discovery. And so typically there's three phases of a call. There's a discovery phase, a presentation phase, a commitment phase, but notice the ratios. Now let's take a look at one of my favorite and biggest influences, Christo. Notice how you feel when you're listening to like Christo versus Jordan Belfort or some of the other boiler room scenes that we saw. So this is kind of the vibe that Chris has. Clients like, you're too expensive. You don't have enough experience. And you're like, oh my God. So you're just fighting each other. But if I say, is it really too expensive? We look at the same problem together. I have cheaper options. Oh, tell me about those cheaper options. Why haven't we used them before? I need this now. Has it worked out before when you've rushed to do things? You see what I'm saying? We're gonna look at the problem together. The question for you is, what are some of the factors when we talk about trust? Notice with Chris, he was like, why haven't you explored those cheaper options? It's more collaborative. It's asking really profound questions. 
And there, there is a great book called The Trusted Advisor, which breaks down the trust equation. So credibility, which is like our credential, our credentials, our ability to do it, the reliability to, to be able to keep our word, intimacy, the our emotions, how we feel when we speak to people, and self orientation, our caring, our true intention, and. Out of everything, self-orientation is the best, is the strongest one, the strongest factor in my opinion. Because if you're able to ask those questions like, hey, those solutions sounds great, why haven't you implemented them? Those things that will potentially kill the deal shows your best interests. And you're no longer a salesperson, you're now a trusted advisor. And I want you to think about this for a second. Who are the biggest trusted advisors in your life? For me, it's Eugene, the person who taught me a lot about neuroscience and his whole line of work it's my friend tom who's a partner of mine for a, a lead generation agency and a consultant it's my jujitsu coach and coaches um in the bottom left vanessa Lau is a really great friend now and christelle these are my close friends and when i think about trust advisor this is the vibe you're a consultant you're a therapist and creative the consultant is the credibility you lead with the credibility in the business acumen the therapist is being able to listen and notice things. The creative, it's being able to think on the fly, to come up with creative solutions for tough problems. And so my question is, how would the selling experience change if you're selling to a really close friend? And we have this diagram, again, from, from understanding trust to change. And we're respecting the three needs for change, the freedom of autonomy to be understood and the need to be consistent. And so if we look at the old rule, selling is all about finding a need, presenting, pitching at all costs. The new rule is really about understanding the problem in the first place and seeing if it's worth solving. Let's look at sales calls a bit differently than um, starting with discovery calls. So in my opinion, discovery calls are the most important thing. They build trust. They actually discover the actual problem. It's about identifying the real problem first and seeing if it's worth solving in the first place. So the goals of a discovery call is like, do we know what the real problem is? Can we solve the problem? Is it even worth to solve this problem? And is it worth to solve the problem now? Common mistakes for sales problems is like asking every single question that's on the script. And this gets in the dichotomy of right versus wrong, which is survival. Focusing on what to say next versus tactical empathy and not personalizing the process. There's an additional one of like pitching way too soon, showing your neediness not seeing see not discovering whether it would even if you can even help in the first place it's an assumption that we're making that we can help everyone but the truth is we can't and so the point is is that this is an agenda not a script every interaction should be personalized and if we ask the questions in right order it looks like a mini funnel it looks like no like and trust so aware, there's an awareness phase of who you are they get to know you Consideration, they're considering you versus other vendors, they like you. And conversion, they trust you. And discovery focuses on this this part. And there's six stages of like these questions. This was taken um, similar questions to Jeremy Miner's NEPQ, but I have adapted them to my own needs. So there's connection questions, situation questions, problem questions, solution questions, consequence questions, and qualification questions, or qualifying questions. I have all this on my uh, in my um, in my master class too. So uh, this is part of the master class. It's in one of these modules. Okay, so let's dive into the first one: connection questions. So the goal of connection questions is to understand the motivation behind setting up the call. So most sales, uh, traditional sales, start with the dreaded blast. I mean, take a look at how long this is. All right, let's take a quick step back to make sure you have a clear idea of what we're covering on our call today. Sound good? Blah blah blah. It's like, oh my God, it's like constant. And this is not it, right? It's like the classic framing, blasting, positioning. Anyways, to give you a little background, blah, blah, this is all in the beginning when you're meeting someone. It's like TMI and it keeps on going too. Does that make sense so far? <laughs> so this is going to trigger a lot of sales resistance. And so if I were to give an analogy, if you're meet someone new and like, let's say if you meet someone new and you introduce yourself like this. So this is how this friendship is going to get started. You're going to do X, Y, Z. And if you don't, well, that's all good, but we'll part ways. Right. And it's like a major red flag. So 
here's a simple connecting question that I always use to open up the open up everything. <clears throat> hey, this is Kevin from business. How's your day treating you? That's just a formality. Well, great. Well, I want to be mindful of our time today. I know we have about an hour. So are you ready to get started? When I'm connecting, I'm just like, so I should probably ask you, what made you want to reach out to us today? Oh, interesting. Anything else that attracted your attention? Can you remind me, how did you find out about us? Right? And sometimes like when you speak to people, people are very eager. How would you respond to someone who'd say, pitch me or sell me? A lot of times I would say, well, XYZ, I appreciate your eagerness to work with us. Make a lighthearted joke. But the truth is, I'm not even sure if we can even help you in the first place. Would you be open to having a deeper dialogue or deeper conversation to discover that first? Something as simple as that. What did I do there? Well, there's a few things that I thought about. It's like, do we even know what the real problem is? Can we even solve the problem? Is it worth solving the problem? And is it worth solving the problem now? We don't know any of this so far. And I wrote this down. Well, I appreciate your eagerness. The truth is, I don't know if we can even help you in the first place until we have a longer discussion. Would you be against having a deeper conversation to figure that out first? Right? So that's how you'd handle that objection, which we'll talk about later. Okay, second thing, situation questions. So situation questions, I think about, you know, understanding the prospect situation, including the current state and future state. So unlike the movies, you don't pitch them right away. Context determines pricing. And even Chris Doe says this all the time. You need to understand the value because otherwise you're just throwing a number into the darkness, hoping that price is going to work for them. And you're leaving it up to them to figure out that sounds reasonable or unreasonable. And we need some context. We're contextual learners, right? So when you throw out a number, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, any of those numbers could sound high or low, depending on what it is that we're measuring it against. So what we need to do is to figure out how do we evaluate this price? Well, we need to talk about what it is that we're trying to solve. So in my mind, I'm always thinking to myself, what's a problem worth solving and I don't care that much about the problem you bring to me in the sense that if it's a small problem like you don't need me to do this just do this yourself it's a small problem well then Chris what's the big problem I said I don't know do you have a big problem to solve and then they tell you so the background fills in the context of the current state and future state right so the current state is where they're at right now future state is where they want to be the gap is like everything that happen needs to happen in the middle so some questions I usually like to ask is like, well, ideally, what are you hoping to accomplish by working with someone like us? Notice I didn't say us by working with us, someone like us, very important, very non-assumptive, not assuming that we're working together. Is there anything else? Um, how long have you been considering something like this though for now? Why now though? Very Jeremy Miner-esque. What's the one thing that you like to accomplish that will make everything easier and unnecessary? This is from the book, The One Thing. Okay, so next step is to determine KPIs. This is really, really important because you need to understand the measuring tool, right? And this avoids like headache later down the line too. So the question is, is like some questions I would ask are like, how would you measure success? What would success look like? For each of these objectives, what's the metric that we will use, whether it's successful or achieved? And so I want to share the story about one of my close friends, and he was doing something called um, CRO work, um, conversion rate optimization, right? Basically testing to see, basically making a bet to see, hey, I can create a sales page that will convert more than your current they build out the sales page and according to google optimize which is what um, my friend was using it was doing great but because he didn't clarify the measuring stick that he had the client was looking at shopify and was like the numbers are so bad what my friend failed to say was that you know shopify doesn't take account of bot traffic but because it was so late in the interaction, they thought they were trying nickel and dime them and they offered them a really great guarantee and stuff. And there was a discrepancy there. And so uh, he almost had to refund that full 15,000 back to the client. And so it goes to this, right? When you think about your dream outcome, it has to be them arriving at their destination and what they would like to experience by Alex Hormozzi. Okay, let's talk about number three, problem questions. So the goal of problem questions is to understand what the problems are and why they have those problems and how it's affecting them. 
But you can't ask simply like, what are your problems? That's kind of weird. It's kind of like this very nuanced thing of like, tell me what you're feeling without me telling what you're feeling. Um, I love those TikTok memes like, tell me that you're Asian without telling me you're Asian. Tell me that you do jujitsu without telling me that you're jujitsu and you see a washing machine. If you do jujitsu, you know, you're, you're always doing laundry. And so what's really interesting is like, when you ask people initially, people will just tell you what they want, right? Um, but you need to get to a deeper level. So this is like the way I think about, about it is like the want. The want is like what they need. And this is usually the nine human wants the things they aren't the true reasons that drive people biologically but usually they'll be like oh it's a bargain it's a, to be informed and you want to these can be used to influence but they're not biologically driven to satisfy these needs and when you're able to identify the why people actually really buy like these biological needs you'll feel a shift in the conversation it almost feels like an energy shift right and we all want these things right and when when they share the life force aid of what they really want we can pull out an emotion you know what if we were to do that what if we were to do xyz i'm curious what would that do for you how would that make you feel right this is a very emotional based selling but it's you can infer it um, but yes, like that's why these things are really, really important. And then we're able to label emotion too, right? So what we're doing is we're creating a tension, right? We're creating emotional tension. If they're able to identify how they're feeling, it creates this, oh man, maybe I'm not feeling that good. Or maybe it reflects on their current state and like, I want this. This creates desire, the gap, the emotional gap creates the desire. And then they have an action to satisfy the desire because of their, their, the need to be consistent with their values and beliefs. And it goes to show you, you can't pitch someone. I can't persuade you. I can't persuade you something that you don't want, right? Tension must exist in your prospect, but tension can only be identified and amplified so what we can do is ask really great questions to um to bring out this tension so notice right discovery presentation commitment right and so when we're asking consequence questions we ask questions like hmm, so what's getting in the way what's keeping you stuck how did you come to that conclusion what's the real challenge for you here how has this affected you so far? How would solving this actually benefit you? Is there anything that you'd like to change about your current situation if you could? Solution questions. So solution questions uh, involve our prospect to think about the effectiveness and decision-making of both the current and past solutions. This is probably the biggest opportunity that I see people make uh, for solution questions. They don't ask like what they tried and what they did before or get the buy-in from the prospect. So the biggest mistake is like telling people what to do and not asking if they tried this previously. So you'll see that people will go through these 45 minute, like these long presentations only be, only be told like, I tried that before and we didn't ask that at that point the client feels misunderstood which goes against that that second need that we're talking about the need to be understood but by asking the right questions we can turn on the executive state this is the difference between told to do something versus intrinsically wanting to do things like for example clean up your room right so your mom telling you clean up your room versus the um internal reason Maybe a hot date is coming over and you're like, oh shoot, I need to clean up, <laughs> right? <laughs> Guys, always keep your room clean, your car clean. It's important. And what this does, right? Um, it turns on our executive state. And it, by going through the solution questions, it allows for critical thinking. So before this question, have you done anything so far about resolving your situation? Are there any options that you've kind of eliminated, consider or, elim uh, or eliminated so far? I'm curious, how did you end up selecting that solution? How did that previous solution work for you? Is there anything that you'd like to change about that experience if you could? 
Have you considered the option of just resolving this yourself or in-house before? There's a consequence question. So the goal of the consequence question is to help your prospect explore the effects of not solving the problem. So whether your prospect realizes it or not, there's a cost of doing nothing. Like with inflate with investing, there's the the not two percent inflation, but almost like six to eight is really bad now. If you don't do anything, you actually can there's a compounding effect the other way. Seth Godin talks about this. The cost of being wrong is less than the cost of doing nothing. Right? Doing nothing is expensive. Sometimes people don't realize it, but you can't tell people that. They need to come to that realization themselves. So some ways to address this is like, I hate to ask you this, but what if your situation continues unchanged or unresolved? What are the potential implications by leaving your situation unresolved? What would happen if you continue doing the same thing over the next 12 months and nothing changes? But let's be real. Some people might be in denial about their situation, right? Like, I'm not fat, you're fat, right? They might say, everything's good. We'll just try harder. I was like, okay. Can I ask you an honest question, though? It sounds like things are going well. So why not stay where you're at? You're, uh, where you are, though? It's interesting. You're building this tension of their need to be consistent through this question. How important is it for you to resolve that, this now, though, if at all? Is that something you're willing to settle for? You don't always need to ask these questions, by the way. Sometimes it can be a little sensitive. So you just use whatever's appropriate. Then we go into qualifying questions. And the, the goal of qualifying questions is to see if there's a if a potential engagement isn't premature. Blair Enns has this great quote. The more objections you hear, the greater your chance of closing. There's one caveat. However, you need to hear them early. Early objections are your friends. Late objections will kill you. Blair Enns. And the solution is to talk about the objections early. Right? Don't avoid them. So what are the most common objections that you hear on a sales call? We'll talk about the more objections later, but it's usually related to timing, decision makers, money. We'll talk about the psychology of money in a bit, but here are the questions I typically ask before any presentation. You know, if you were to go ahead with the solution um, like this, when will you consider starting? Okay, but why now though? Why is that? Is there someone else who isn't in this conversation that'd be influential uh, in making a decision for the solution? If they were in this room, what would the concerns be for a solution like this? Another question I like to ask, minimum level engagement. So I want to be mindful of your financial situation. I want to be, make sure that engagement isn't premature. So the minimum level engagement to work with us is X amount of dollars over Y months. Does this sound like a number that you can possibly work with? Or you can do price bracketing, which we'll talk about in a bit. The engagement to work with us uh, can range from X amount of dollars on the higher end to Y amount of dollars on the lower end. Do these sound like numbers that you can possibly work with? Does this, is this a range that you can possibly work with? Just curious, where are you in this range? If they're over making over a hundred million, you can ask like, hey, do you currently have a discretionary spend? Meaning is there an amount that they can spend without getting approval? This is for more complex buying, um, complex uh, sales cycles. And then there's the transition. So at this point, I can walk you through about how we can help you reach your goals if you like, but you tell me, is it appropriate to go over at this time? There's more to talk about, including presentation, feedback, and commitment phase, but let's talk about the most anxiety and producing part of the conversation. It's about money. We're talk taught not to talk about it until the end. But what happens? The longer we drag it out, the more anxiety builds. It feels like a roller coaster. And as anxiety is building, it's building up more survival state in your prospect. And your client is no longer focused on the problem. They're focused on how much is this going to cost? And it's interesting. Blair Ann says this. Have you ever been in a presentation or a client uh, or prospect only look up to see that everyone on the other side of the table has flipped to the last page to see the price? Does it drive you nuts? It drives everybody nuts. Yet few people actually stop to think that the problem is easily solved. The prospect will not flip to the last page if he already knows what the price is. What happens when you price drop with the awkward three to five uh, second power pause? So we're taught to be like, it's $10,000. The idea is to leave a silence so that your, your prospect can fill in the space. 
But a lot of times, at this point, it triggers a lot of survival, specifically fight, flight, or freeze. But what if there was a frictionless way to talk about money? What if instead of treating this roller coaster like a freaking, I don't know, Six Flags like crazy one where you're going upside down and whatnot, and turning into a kid's roller coaster? So we have a minimum level, so we're asking a minimum level of engagement question, which is like kind of like the first hurdle, the biggest one, then presentation, and then just lower the anxiety throughout the thing and not trigger a survival reaction. Blairens has a really great question. Those who can't talk about money don't make it. So what we do is set a, little, a minimum level of engagement. So we set a minimum level of engagement and declare early in the conversation. So if the client can't afford us, both parties can walk away before wasting valuable resources, right? And so um, we have to ask ourselves, what is the MLO? And it's the minimum that someone's going to spend with you over the course of your relationship. It could be a year, it could be a predetermined amount of time. And so an example of this is like, our minimum level of engagement is 100K over the course of 12 months. So it allows us to talk about money early and making it less awkward and just seeing if the client can afford us before wasting our time, their time, and our resources. So a way to address this is like, so I like to be mindful of our uh, of your financial situation and want to make sure that an engagement like this isn't premature. So the minimum level of engagement to work with us is X amount of dollars. Does this sound like a number that you could possibly work with, right? And so this is how you can use the MLO or minimum level of engagement to address any money issues. So you could just point out the gap like I did last time and say, hey, before we go too far, I just, um, I'm a little concerned, you're a smaller organization than we're used to doing business with. I'm just a little concerned about your ability to afford us and then pause, embrace silence. Or you could say, hey, before we go too far, I just need you to know that we have a minimum level of engagement of X in fees over the course of 12 months. So X might be um, 10 grand, it might be 100 grand, it might be 10 million. The st so that's the MLO. And the starting point for X is 10% of your fee target for the year. Notice that he addresses all the money issues earlier. So solution two, implement price bracketing and price anchoring. So what happens if you have several services or a wide range of customized services? Then that's when we look into price bracketing. So what is price bracketing? It's basically providing a wide range of numbers to help a uh, for pricing guidance, it helps the client get a sense of how much you'll charge. It's a subtle way of providing pricing guidance in form of a range. So a way to use it, I also like to be mindful of your financial situation. Client engage engagements to work with us can range from X amount of dollars on the high end to Y on the lower end. Does this sound like a range that you can possibly work with? Where are you in this range, if at all? Do you need budget approval or have a discretionary spend? So here's an example of price packeting. Based on what we've discussed, pretty much what Joe said, right? Uh, th thus far, similar projects have cost between this amount and this amount. So 300 to $150,000. And then I follow up with a question. Does that budget range work for you? Does that budget work for you? So the power of price bracketing is price anchoring. So what you didn't see there was anchoring. By the way, anchoring is a heuristic. It's a mental shortcut. It primes the thought process around the first piece of information. So basically what that means in layman terms is anchoring is just setting expectations. And the key to price bracketing is to anchor high and above where you expect the client to spend. So what we do typically is we start with the high first, then go to the lower range. So based on what we discussed thus far, projects ha similar projects have cost between X amount of dollars, between Y amount of dollars. Does this budget work for you? The thing is, is the more objections you hear, the greater your chance of closing. One caveat, you need to hear them early. Early objections are your friends. Late objections will kill you. And it goes back to that philosophy of being understood, the need to feel understood. And what we can do is we can use this to address any hesitation or bias resistance bef uh, before continuing with the proposal or conversation. Proposals take a long time, by the way. It's not fun, you know? So it's best to address anything, get a verbal commitment, yes, before doing any of that work. And even if they do say yes, like, yeah, we're open to it. Hey, 
Seems like you're a bit hesitant or uncomfortable with this range. What's on your mind? Well, I noticed that you said yes, but it seemed like you're hesitant. Is there anything that's on your mind? Right? Okay, let's talk about the third thing. Provide solutions based on risk. So Peter Drucker, father of management consulting, um, says all profit is derived from risk. He has these rules. Rule number one, the party that assumes more risk profits more. So let's take a look at insurance premiums. No one likes insurance, but you know, a premium is amount paid for the policy to assure against risk. So the more you pay for a premium, the more protection, lower premium, less protection. So like, for example, you get in an accident. Let's say if you're like a lot of Asian families, they don't like paying a lot for insurance, com uh, insurance premiums. Actually, a lot of people don't like paying for insurance premiums, but what happens? You cheap out on the premium. Something happens to your car. You're taking on more. You might be saving more money every single month, but if something happens, you're taking on majority of the risk. You pay a higher deductible if you can't afford it and there's less protection for the owner. Okay. But let's look at the other end. The insurance assumes majority risk. Insurance profits more, right? By doing a higher premium, the, the insurance company is making a bet that you won't get in an accident. They're assuming majority of risk. They're going to be profiting more if nothing happens. And they pay, but if something does happen, they have to pay majority of it. And it's more protection for the owner. In some sort of weird way, it's almost like gambling, <laughs> essentially. And we look at the risk continuum. So at the low end, like for all... Pre Pre, um, premiums client assumes majority risk client profits more less protection for the client and the client is opting in for that on the right side provider assumes majority risk provider profits more more protection for the client okay rule number two premium prices insure against risk or buy a guarantee with premium offers um our clients pay more to assure against risk or get for or pay for the guarantee so the more risk we take away the bolder or bolder guarantee, the more that we can charge. So here's the premium pricing relationship with a DIY on the left side, right? We don't have control over everything. The client has to do work, right? They're base, they're in the process. There's a high variability in outcomes and it's harder to provide a guarantee. Some people want a guarantee for a course, but how can you do that if you're not 100%, if you don't have 100% control over it? On the other hand, with the agencies, there's a lower variability in outcomes because most of the time you have a team that is doing consistent work. So because of that, there's less variability. It's easier to provide a consistent experience or a consistent outcome, right? And because you're not relying on contingencies from the client, like you can provide everything that you need. And so what premium offers, our clients can pay more to assure against risk or a guarantee. The more risk we take away or more, more the more we can charge. So like since done for you are more closely and the sides, like the business behind this, behind the KPIs is like with lagging metrics, these are the metrics that you don't have control over. Like I can't really directly control revenue, but for a leading metric, I can control the amount of calls I make. Like these are actionable, these are tied to actions, right? But when we're look, comparing done for you services to do it yourself, do it yourself are tied to more lagging metrics and we can tie leading metrics to the, to the value-based engagements. So on the far left, you're selling um, money per hour. You're selling time. For X amount of dollars, I will sell you Y time. For the middle one, for project engagements, right? For uh, X amount of dollars, I will complete this project, regardless of the outcome. It's kind of in the middle, right? Selling capacity. For value-based engagements, you're paying for outcome, selling guaranteed outcome. For X amount of dollars, we'll ensure that you get Y outcome on time in no way inconvenience. It's white glove, it's concierge, it's bespoke. I never used that word, but I found out what it meant last year. And so the goal of value-based pricing is not to charge more, but it's a it's a side effect, really. The goal of value-based pricing is to create experience that is just focused on creating extraordinary customer value and get paid as a consequence of it. So premium prices uh, for the client ensure that the provider should take away uh, risk for the outcome. So what are examples for some packages? Maybe it might be uh, for digital marketing, it's done, do it yourself. So you send a bunch of trainings over there, pre-recorded, very low value in my opinion. Why it's like very cheap. There's done with you. So giving you a marketing team, launching a campaign. 
And then there's done for you, value-based Google ad agency with a row as target. So this hopefully will give you a better idea. So rule number three, provide options so that the client can be allowed to choose their risk level. So once we know our solutions, how do we present which solution to present? How do we assess our potential client's risk tolerance? Well, one of the biggest mistakes we can make is providing a single solution. Oftentimes we're bad at assessing clients' risk tolerance and we want to choose what's best for our clients. So we let them choose. Blair Enns agrees with this. He says your clients should be able to choose the risks they like to mitigate and therefore premiums that they like to purchase. How do clients know what is value, valuable and what's their level of risk? Let's go over an example. So if I show you this bottle, is this, is this spicy? You might take a second. If you're Viet, you're probably like, dude, I just drink this like water, right? <laughs> or if you're Thai or anything like that too. And so how do you determine if it's spicy? Well, you could probably compare it to things. Um, I think the left is a bell pepper. The right is like a Carolina, Carolina Reaper, I think. Um, that or ghost pepper, I think it's Carolina Reaper. But you know based off comparison. And so it brings up this really interesting thing where we suck at perceiving absolute value, but we're really good at determining what, if one thing's more valuable than the other. Blair N says we can, people cannot accurately assign monetary value to something. They can only discern whether one thing is more valuable than the other. When we don't give options, we don't know what's expensive. We don't know what's too cheap. Since value is subjective, sometimes we're oftentimes we're horrible at assessing um, our client's risk tolerance. So most people don't like being backed into a corner. And a single solution often triggers the survival state. You're just providing one thing, right or wrong, and it loves binary thinking. So the solutions offer multiple solutions, ideally three. That's what they do in consulting. And we see this in SaaS quite a bit. So go high level, they have three different packages, right? And here's what it looks like in a sales conversation, right? So finally, the last thing that we should cover are potential solutions that could help your situation. Would it be helpful if we go over that? Would it be appropriate to go over that? In terms of solutions, we have three options. Right? We, start with the, we start with the most expensive option first and end with the cheapest option to take advantage of price anchoring. And then we check in with them. So I wanna be mindful of your situation. Do you feel like any of these solutions could be what you're looking for? And then when you offer solutions, it shifts the conversation from how do I know if this is good value to which one of these is the better value? If the prospect selects an option, what's next? Well, we need to reinforce and activate the um, their executive state so they can make the best decision for themselves we're not manipulating at all we want them to be in their executive state because that's how they make the best decision for themselves so then we go through a feedback phase right so the public perception of selling is fighting to earn their business which triggers survival state with fbi people you think that you kick down a door and take names but really it's actually on the phones you want to peaceful resolution a lot of time and rather than going guns blazing even the most tense situations are resolved with conversation so you might ask hey is this help you want to know if it's helpful for them how it will help them uh, do they need to do this right now addressing objections and concerns so how does this look like in a sales conversation do you feel like this could be something that you're looking for do you feel like this is something that you can implement and benefit from so that you can get to the goals that we talked about before how important for the, uh, is this process for you to implement right now, though? Is there anything else that you'd like to address with me? Right. These are really, really important. But oftentimes you shouldn't take their answers at face value. Right. There's usually a deeper level sometimes. And so rather than answering a question like, you know, like um, you want to understand the intent behind things, you know. So like, why do you feel like it is, though? How so? Can you walk me through how you see this working out for you and your business? Why now though, right? And then we have the commitment phase. So commitment, contrary to belief, it's not about commanding or assuming the sale. Um, a lot of times at this point, they're already invested to resolving the issue. Could be with you, could be someone else. I still don't make that like assumption. And it's about aligning the next steps and allowing them to decide the next appropriate steps, right? So the problem with most, I want to ask you something like it's kind of unrelated. Well, it's related, but what's the problem with most marriage proposals? A lot of people will go on one knee and be like, will you marry me? But it's often assumptive and high pressure, 
right? This is a prank channel, by the way. It's pretty funny. So what you want to do is map out the next steps as part of the commitment phase. So while I don't have anything else to go over with you at this point, it looks like we covered pretty much everything that you are possibly looking for. Really, the next step if we move to if we were to move forward is to collect some information, make an arrangement for investment. We can do something like a card. At that point, we'll do X, Y, Z. After that, we'll set you up with the team. We'll make sure that you're good to go and all that, right? And then you create the next steps. We could do that or would that be appropriate or how would you like to proceed from here? We could do that, but what do you feel like would be the next best steps for your situation? If they need more time, we can you can set up a tentative time on the calendar. Oftentimes, I will give more people like people are like, I just need to think about it. I'm like, OK, um, that's not a problem. I want to make sure that you you uh, get all the time you need. If you, this is a big decision, um, I guess what's on your mind? Understanding that first and then just being like, OK, you know, how much time would you need? Right. And then they're like, oh, I would need like three days. I'm like, OK, why don't I do this? I'll give you like four days, right? Um, I want to make sure that you make the best decision for yourselves, but I also want to make sure that we're we're moving forward. If this is something that you truly feel like is the best thing for you. And so that's when you go into this. That's not a problem. Would, if, would it be helpful if we got out our calendars and scheduled 10 at a time so we can discuss the next best step for you? And then step four are objections. So we are going to talk about step four objections. This part is probably my weakest. I'm not the best at objection handling. For me, I like to prevent a lot of my things up front, upstream, rather and prevent the objections ahead of time. Personally, when I was exploring how to handle objections, I had to look at people like Chris Voss, Jeremy Miner, and I found my favorite person that talks about objections, Chris Doe. So we're going to be breaking down a lot of the frameworks that he's taught and I've linked to his references below. But when we talk about objections, what makes objection handling so difficult for a lot of newbies? And when I think about objection handling, it requires a few things. Trust, tactical empathy and listening skills, EQ, being able to read the room, and also leading the conversation too. You can't just say a rebuttal and not lead the conversation there's a bit of that and a lot of beginners from what i see they lack the soft skills and nuance of tonality pacing and all that too they get an objection and guess what they immediately go into survival state which reminds me of this quote everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face mike tyson it's the same thing with jujitsu and all combat sports where we all have a plan going in but a lot of times things don't go the way that we want it to Things just happen in life and we got to be okay with that. So as much as of a plan that you have, things will go array. Uh, array. Keep in mind something that they, like a lot of people will tell you, these are industry standard numbers, but it varies offer offer. But people say that 20, 30% is pretty common and that's a really good close rate. You know, it's really, really interesting, right? So how do we deal with these real world punch in the face uh, moments in sales, AKA objections. And um, earlier we played this, this quote. You have to be closing all the time and be aggressive, learn how to push and have your rebuttals ready. Guy says, call me tomorrow. <laughs> Somebody tells you that they got money problems about buying 200 shares is lying to you. And there is no such thing as a no sale call. So angry, bro. <laughs> it's really interesting though because this is a very old school way of thinking about objections. But this book, The Catalyst, one of my favorite books on persuasion, we think that if we give people enough information, they'll come around. If we share more evidence, list more reasons, or put together the right deck, people will switch. But just as often, this blows up in our faces. Rather than shifting our perspectives, people dig in their heels. Rather than changing, they become even more convinced that they are right. It's a very interesting. And so oftentimes most sales gurus will tell you that, you know, it's a fight. It's a, like, there's a fight, but this is what objection handling kind of really looks like. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it. 
in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just- Don't! Ah, oh, so funny. What do we notice about those things? This interaction. And this interaction is sums up objection handling all the time. We want to fix things, fix things, fix things. But really what we need to do is actually listen a little bit more. Rather than try and persuade, start by understanding. Why, why is the supplier's price higher than desired? Perhaps their cost gone up. What about dirty dishes in the sink that makes your spouse so upset? Maybe it's the dishes themselves. Maybe it's a constant reminder of larger unresolved issues. In that diagram that I showed you from the catalyst, it talks about the three stages of understanding, trust, and then change. By the way, this is uh, one of the ClickFunnels uh, sales managers in the past, Randall. He's actually a really great guy, but he even said this too. Majority of closers are soft. 10, 15 years ago, it's normal to spend two to three hours on a call, overcoming objections, creating deals. We didn't have scheduled calls on the hour. Plus we had free shipping leads and lay downs didn't happen. Hundred deals were created. This is how traditional closers used to spend their time, but no disrespect to people like Randall. But what if there was a more efficient way? So the root cause for most objections happening is our counterpart not feeling understood. Maybe there was something that they didn't convey or communicate. Sometimes there's missing information that they didn't mention. And it's our job rather than fix the problem to uncover everything out front. For example, when someone says, I don't see the value, that tells me that we probably didn't do a good job listening. When we're making decisions, when people think about changing, they compare things to their current state, the status quo. And if the potential gains barely outweigh the potential losses, they don't budge. To get people to change, the advantages have to be at least twice as good as the disadvantages. People don't realize there's a cost for transition, tr cost of tr uh, migration. But the truth is, sometimes being twice as good isn't as enough ROI sometimes. In this great book by uh, Donald Miller, Business Made Simple, he talks about, hey, you know, a dream team member for any employer is to, uh, who actively tries to get their boss a 5x or greater return on their investment. I know that sounds crazy, and, uh, but after a cost of overhead ancillary expenditures, a 5x or greater return on a team member it usually means the company narrowly makes a profit. So again, it's putting ourselves in an empathetic state um, and just really understanding logically we need to make a 5x return for them. But what is the most difficult part of objection handling? From my experience, objections will honestly trigger your survival state. And the goal of objection handling is to win the micro battle of managing your executive state and survival state. So how do we do this? How do we go about this? Is there a systematic way that we can handle objections? And this is how I typically do it. It doesn't happen all at once. It's not like I wait to get an objection and I'm doing all these things. I take it step by step. So step one, identify their social style. When it comes to objections, like I need to think about it. What does traditional sales tell you? Buyers are liars. You feel felt found. Um, very logical logic traps, right? If I asked you for $4, but then I told you I can give you 10, would you give it to me? And when you use logic traps too, you end up like the, um, the nail analogy where a lot of times the clients want to be heard, not solve the problem in the moment. Traditional sales advice will say that everyone needs to buy now or should be persuaded to buy right this second. And a lot of times I follow the opposite. I want people to be in their executive state. They believe that people will talk themselves out of it. And honestly, if they talk themselves out of it, they don't see a benefit, then they probably shouldn't be a client, right? 
That's just the way I view things. The need to buy now to pers be persuaded to buy the second. Is this necessarily true? And from a fulfillment standpoint, do you want everyone to buy when they aren't completely ready? The truth is everybody makes their decisions very, very differently. And if you've been in corporate uh, or you've been in consulting, they teach this model. It's called the Tracom social styles. There's four types. There's a driver style, the expressive style, analytical style, amiable style. So when you're trying to understand like what is some, so when I, let's break down each one of these styles. So driver, these are your A type personalities, right? They focus, they're very direct, they're outspoken, they just want to focus on the goals. A lot of times they can be very assertive or pushy. Um, and honestly, a pattern of theirs is like, they can be a poor listener. They like to interrupt, they over speak over people, right? A lot of times they speak really, really fast. And there's a lot of other things, right? But they're usually typically focused on the, on the primary drivers or primary goals. Then we have expressive. These people emote a lot. They have a lot of motion. They get excited. They have, they're animated. And oftentimes they want to be part of the decision-making process and have their ideas heard, right? They are your typical, like a lot of salespeople are actually uh, expressive and they love talking a lot. They're not very organized, very unstructured, have a, has a lot of ideas, but they don't actually execute on them sometimes. And they have, they have shiny object syndrome. Now let's go to the other side. Let's talk about amiables. I think about my mom when I, when I think about amiables, they're more friendly. They're very nurturing. They're a little bit more quiet. They listen a lot and they react to what you're saying. A lot of time they go with the flow. They don't really have a strong sense of urgency too and they really care about the relationships. And then there's the analytical. These are your data analysts or uh, more logical people. I would want my CPA to be analytical. They're logical, they're pretty formal, and they they're very focused. They love paper, they're very attention to detail, right? So we plot these all on a graph for a second, right? On the social style graph. How do you identify it? Well, it's really easy. So you separate the quadrants. You can be like, okay, do they ask for permission a little bit more or do they tell you what to do, right? And so that's the left or right quadrant. If they tell me what to do, okay, I can narrow it down. It's probably driver or expressive. If they're more reserved and they're more asking, right? They're asking for my opinion or they're asking for like, or um, they're a little bit slower, right? To make a decision. They're probably analytical or amiable. Now let's go down to emotions, right? Like, do they, are they emoting or not? And so for analytical and drivers, they're a little bit more reserved with their emotions. Amiable and expressive, they're a lot more emotional. So that's how you can tell. So you can do left, right, top, bottom. And so with sales professionals, like I alluded to earlier, what is the most common style? This picture says it all. This is a Jordan Belfort, Wolf of Wall Street poster. You can tell a lot of fun, you know, slick talkers and all that as well. Expressive. So how do you identify a social style? Well, is this person more asking or telling? Are they more reserved or more open with their emotions, right? And this is how you can tell. What's really interesting to the right is like the needs. When you're working with a driver, they want results. When you're working with the expressive, they want their opinion heard. They want approval. When uh, you're talking to an amiable, they want to feel safe and just be like, this is the right relationship. And when you're working with the analytical, they want to be right. And it talks about the weaknesses of each, the opportunities for each of these. For uh, drivers, they don't listen too well. Expressive, they jump all over the place, very impulsive. Amiable, they tend to not take action. Analytical, they seem to be pushing a lot over time as you work with more styles there's something called a versatility score and your versatility score actually increases with experience and time which i'll talk about later so great so we can identify social styles but how do we actually use them well here's some use cases for social styles identifying needs tactical empathy survival state management so identifying needs so like i said earlier every social style has needs need is what they care about their preference is how they make decisions, right? So for example, analyticals tend to take a little bit longer to make decisions, to review the data and all that. Amiables, they prefer to like, they prefer to ask other people's opinion, right? Get a collective opinion. 
Drivers prefer just to jump into it, take action. Expresses are very similar. They just like, they're very spontaneous. The weaknesses are the opportunities that we talked about before, like things to keep in mind, like drivers don't listen that much. Analytical people tend to be uh, pushing. The problem with analyticals, they tend to be over logical sometimes. Amiables, they tend to delay action. And impulsiveness um, for expressives. Analysis paralysis also happens with analytical a lot. So let's talk about tactical empathy. When we're talking to our counterpart, we want to base this on their social style, not our own. So we want to align our presentation to their needs and social styles. So when I'm speaking to amiables and they're making a decision up, right? Um, a lot of times I will ask about the other decision makers and, and whatnot and their opinions and if it would be helpful to have them uh, on the call and how these decisions would affect the jobs of other people. For expressives, I would focus on kind of getting their input on the current plan that we have. They really want to be heard a lot of time. For drivers, I keep it very short, very goal oriented. I don't usually use a lot of feelings or anything like that. How do you feel? It's like, what do you mean how we feel? I just want to get the results, right? And then the analyticals, providing all the data and everything that I need ahead of time and also giving them a little bit more time to make decisions too. And what we notice is like everybody on the left tend to um, tend to t take longer decisions than on the right side in terms of the assertiveness. Your ability to adapt to different social styles increases your versatility score. And versatility score, hate to break it to you, but it only increases with experience and time. You can know all these concepts, but until you actually deal with it, you won't really know. The other thing that's really interesting is survival state management. There's this great book I'm really loving is The Road Less Stupid. Smart people do dumb things, especially in survival state. So according to this framework that we're using, each each style might have some fears that might trigger their the style's survival state. So for analytical, their fear is being wrong. So not having enough information, making a wrong decision, being forced to decide on the spot. Interesting. So when you tell an analytical person, you need to make a decision right now, it triggers their survival state. Same with the amiable, right? Damage relationships. So if they're making a decision without their partner or business partner or anything like that, that's a huge thing. Confrontation. They don't want confrontation, right? That's why they want to buy input from everyone not being recognized for their effort. And so for a driver, loss of control, failure, lack of purpose. For expressive, being ignored, right? That's why you ask for input. Being asked for detail and go to specifics. Being linked and associated with failure. But how do you know if a certain style is in their survival state? Well, so each style has their own backup behaviors or behaviors when they're really stressed out. When um, a driver in the right-hand corner is in their survival state, they're autocratic, meaning they just take over. A lot of times with uh, expressives, when you back them into a corner, they attack you, right? They explode on you. When a analytical is like backed into a corner, they avoid. They avoid making a decision on the spot. And amiable, they acquiesce, meaning they cave in, they give in to the demands. This quote really is really interesting, right? When I was reading this book, I was thinking about how do you activate your executive state? And Keith Cunningham, he says, you'll run your business more effectively and make more money and dramatically increase the likelihood of keeping that money if you adopt the discipline of thinking time. And when you take the thinking time, we activate the executive state. And so by asking certain questions and sometimes even allowing people to make decisions, like for the for an, uh, for amiable and uh, analytical, we can activate their, their executive state. Social styles just give us a better idea, understanding of how people make decisions. Keep in mind, everybody's a little bit different, but something interesting to know. So as you're discovering their style, you want to be implementing this, not only for objections, you want to implement this in your sales conversations too. Because the, there's you're using these basic frameworks to understand someone, like style, their working style. It's not a personality test, it's working style. As we're adapting to their style, it makes them feel understood and we're fulfilling that need right there. So what's the next step after you understand the social style? One of the things I've been thinking about and playing with a lot is attachment styles. 
And attachment styles is actually a, a framework or for understanding relationships and how they respond and manage conflict. Really interesting. This is about romance, but we can actually bring this into the, the business world. And so there are four attachment styles. There's the anxious, meaning I uh, want to be close. I don't want them to abandon me. There's avoidance, meaning you just want to avoid all co confrontation. You're self-sufficient. They're secure. You're able to talk about issues as they come up. And then there's a disorganized. This is a mixed bag. Sometimes you're anxious. Sometimes you're avoidant. You, you don't know what the hell you are. <laughs> In relationships, how many of you guys can relate to this? Who's texting you? Oh, he breaths things. Not texting me, right? Are you lying? No, look. How do I know it's not some girl you renamed Matt? Look, I won't do that to you, okay? I gotta go finish editing the video. It's gonna be up by eight. Call you later, okay, babe? Okay. Love you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, and then go to Matt, and then you go over to widescreen, and then choose 235, and then you'll get the black bars. Oh, that's it? Yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. Yo, I'm gonna grab some ice cream. You want some? Yeah, sure. All right. Oh, shit! Jay? What are you doing here? I was making sure you were actually going to Matt's. Babe, I wouldn't lie to you, okay? Wait, wait, wait. How'd you get in, though? I climbed through the window. But we're on the 10th floor. Okay, uh... Anyways, I gotta go back to editing, so... I'll leave you later, dude. Okay, bye. You better. Bye. This is the classic runner-chaser relationship. And when we compare this to sales, this is a runner chaser death spiral in sales. You have the closer who's anxious. They're in survival. They're pushing hard, hard closing a deal. They might be in a flight response, resorting to drugs, getting drunk on the calls. They might freeze, not respond to a proposal. That's the anxious side. And then there's the prospect. They're arguing with the objections, ghosting you. I need to think about it. Things like that. And it's interesting. The closer will usually pressure the prospect. And then the prospect will just run away. What's really interesting is that insecure attachment cells are a form of survival state. But imagine if you could be a secure attachment cell. So here's what a secure attachment cell is. Helping but not overextending. Inviting, not pushing. Setting clear boundaries. Staying cool as a cucumber regardless of the outcome. And this is why self-care is so important. It is activate it activates you in an executive state so that you can respect your own boundaries and just actually take the time to listen the last one <laughs> staying cool as a cucumber um all this i actually got from christo so you can help yourself by developing a secure attachment by learning to self-regulate build a better relationship with yourself and manage disruptive emotions and impulses this is my friends is executive state at its finest so if you're with someone who's avoidant or anxious or has an insecure attachment style how do you manage that and this is where i find um the attachment style so helpful you need to hold space and understand everybody communicates a little differently so for an avoidant partner like in a romantic relationship it's like hey i really appreciate um the way you put so much effort into keeping our home and things repaired I see how that's one of your ways to keep us safe and i feel in love with that for your anxious partner it's validating them hey it makes it makes a lot of sense that you feel this way right now i'm here right with you i'm not sure how we're going to work it out but right now i'm just want to be here what would support look like for you and in sales for avoidant partner i would be like hey it seems like you'd like a little bit more time to make your decision i want to respect that right i want to respect your right to make a decision by yourself i'll let you do that um just in the meanwhile how can I best support you? And if you get a time commitment, you delay it more. Just be like, hey, how much time do you realistically need? Okay, why don't I do this? I want to give you a little bit extra time and just letting them control that interaction. For an anxious partner, someone who wants to be with you all the time, right? And wants you to figure out now, now, now. It's like, hey, it seems like there's something on your mind. We'll figure this out together. I'm not sure how yet, but just want to let you know. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here with you. That's how that's one of the things that you can do to calm down your your counterpart. But if you continue to chase with the insecure attachment style, then you'll only trigger more survival state. So what does this have to do with sales? And so in sales, when speaking to an insecure attachment style, it might look like this. 
Hey, I really appreciate you being so honest with me in your current situation. It just helps me see how to be mindful of your situation so you can better understand where you're at and what you would possibly need, right? Anxious, I really appreciate you with being so honest with me in your current situation. I'm not sure how we're going to work through this, but just let you know, we'll figure out a solution together. Very, very simple. And you can use labeling on top of this too. So in general, we need to lead by being the secure partner, by getting ourselves in the executive state. When we're in the executive state, we can it sparks curiosity. We can ask the right questions and activate the prospects executive state as well. But what questions do you ask in the first place? Step six, ask the Socratic six. This is what Christo came up with and is one of my favorite frameworks. The art of asking the right questions activates the executive state. And so in The Road Less Stupid, one of Keith Cunningham's questions is, what don't I see? It really forces him to challenge the assumptions that he's making about the problem he has, the solution that he's creating, or the opportunity in front of us. It forces us to really think through our problems as well. And so the goal behind the Socratic Six is to understand the intent behind the counterpart's question or comment. So they might be asking like, hey, does your solution actually work? When in reality, it's actually the money that they're, they're concerned about. You just don't know. Sometimes people ask bad questions. One of the things I like to think about before any engagement is like, what's the best, the best defense is a better defense. Uh, the best offense is a better defense. The mistake that most professionals make is that they're reactive about their objections versus being proactive. Even on my notion boards, I have all my objection handling all there. And I just literally one click a button. I got the general framework. I customize it to that specific conversation. And then there's the accusation audit. This is from never split the difference. This is when you proactively bring up and address the objections. Someone is like to lead think before the client does. And if you know the most common uh, objections that you can pair, prepare it ahead of time. This scene is from eight mile. If you ever seen that movie Eminem, like there's a rap battle scene and Eminem basically calls out everything that the person's about to say and he's left with nothing. So here's some common objections. You're too expensive. This isn't a priority right now. You're all the same. I need to think about it. What guarantees can you make? We already have someone doing this job. I need to speak to my partner. This is more than what I need. And so when I think about the Socratic six, after you kind of do the accusation on it, the Socratic six is what you lean on. These are question based responses that you can use to clarify the objection and just help the client feel understood. So number one, it's the raging bull. So we use this when emotions are high, conversations aren't productive, or there's a disconnect with body language. You know, what it is, is acknowledging the emotion with labeling or mirroring. This empathizes with them, helps them feel understood, diffuses attention and makes sure and helps your counterpart feel understood. So how do you use it? A lot of times it's visual language. It seems like it sounds like it looks like it feels like. It mirrors the last one or three words by a client. So what uh, the tonality that you should use is the late night DJ voice. Oh, sorry, my voice just cracked. The late night DJ voice. It's kind of like mysterious, a bit sexy. So that's what it is, right? And so here's what it is. We tried this already. You sound like every other salesperson who wasted my time. It sounds like you're a bit frustrated. What's on your mind? Right? That's one way to handle it. Mirror, every other salesperson, those are two ways to handle it. So the next next tactic is the hall of mirrors. So this is when you're asked a difficult question and don't know how to answer it, right? Or maybe you just don't want to. So answer a question with a question. Easy way is to invert the dialogue and make them reflect their line of thinking. The goal is really to get them to think, why did I even ask this in the first place? And really question the intent. And sometimes they'll answer it to clarify or They'll just be like, oh, I actually don't know. I actually take that question back. And so when you use it, you want to ask another question, invert the question while using as many of the same words that they use. So your goal is just to be really curious, inquisitive. So everything sounds good, but what guarantees can you offer to make sure this works out? One way would be like, well, what kind of guarantees do you need to make this work? By offering a guarantee, what are you hoping to accomplish? Are guarantees always a good thing? Uh, What are your top 
three biggest concerns with working with us. Those are some ways to address it. All right, then there's a double down technique. Number three, this is when someone makes, kind of puts down your work, they make a random objection, right? And the goal of their, the goal for them is to lower your rates by decreasing, like minimizing the perceived value of your work. What it is, is just agreeing with it and doing an accusation audit, right? Embrace it. It's basically calling the bluff. So when you use it, you just agree with them. It has to be curious, inquisitive, sincere, right? This can sometimes come off very sarcastic and can end up not so great. So let's say you're working with a, with a client. How hard can this be? We already tried working with another company and we have an in-house team to do the same for half the rate. And what you say is, well, you're right. This isn't very hard. I'm pretty sure your team can do uh, this for half the cost. Sounds like every other company has a lot of experience and you're probably going to pay me too much to do it. So real question, why not do this yourself? This is where you use a strategic why question. There's a yin yang where the client uses the aspect of your business, team size, past clients, your past process, location as leverage against you. It's basically what it is, is really asking a question. If this is true, is the opposite true? So it makes them really question their logic. So what you want to do is ask questions that um, challenge the assumption of being absolute. The more you can identify, the more faulty the logic will seem. Again, this is one of those other things where you have to be very curious about, like very cautious of your tonality. So for example, the client says, your team's too expensive. Okay. So is expensive always bad? And is cheaper always better? Then there's the wolf. The wolf, what do wolves do? They howl, right? So you ask how. So this is what you use this when the client asks for a very difficult request uh, or impossible requests, right? And um, basically it's a way to force empathy and get them to assist you with the problem. So for example, um, you want to use the late night DJ voice, curious, empathetic. So this would be like, I'm happy you move forward today if you can reduce your rates by 30%. Oh, you know, that is a very kind offer, by the way. But question for you, how do you propose that we pull 30% out of the budget while giving you the same service? How are we supposed to do that? Then you pause, fill in, let them fill in the silence. Super powerful. People do this all the time when they ask it for a discount, but we strategically plan our rates the way that they're planned. It prevents any resentment from me going to a relationship, but more interestingly enough, it actually invites the client to just, it's easy to poke holes at things, but to actually come with a solution, that's really, it's really interesting. This happens a lot when people try to discount you, but something I always keep in mind when I set my rates, these are the rates that are the rates that I won't feel resentful about. I won't feel bad about. I won't want to leave the client in three months, four months, because there's a better client out there, right? It prevents this uh, dialogue. And then there's the five-year-old, right? The five-year-old, this is when the client throws an objection at you that's difficult to answer because you don't have enough context. Context is everything. And so what do five-year-olds say? Oh, well, I don't know. And then they ask why. And it's a way to get more clarity about the core um, objection. It also helps understand the intent behind the question too, and forces them to, this is also the strategic why. We also use the late night DJ voice here. This is uh, some responses. So the client says, why should I work with you? I don't know, but I'm curious. Why did you originally reach out to us in the first place? I don't know. Just so I can understand, was there a particular reason why you asked that question? I don't know. Why do you need someone to do the work in the first place? So the goal of the Socratic Six is really to help your client feel understood and initiate a conversation and discussion. That's where this next step comes in. It allows the space for your counterpart to talk and understand about the impact uh, or concern of the concern or problem without triggering the survival state. We're forcing them to think through everything. And like I said earlier, the type of questions we use are really important, right? So if they're in a survival state, why will definitely trigger a survival state sometimes? And we can do that strategically just like with the five-year-old technique. How is the language of the executive state, right? So if they're in an executive state, you'd use that. But if you don't know where they're at, you can always use what? right so for example how would you like to proceed from here what are you hoping to achieve by doing xyz what if you got started today 
Why would you ever change the way that you've always done things and try this approach? Some other ways to stimulate discussion is from my favorite book by Michael uh, Bungay Stainer, uh, The Coaching Habit. And a lot of these things I love, right? So he talks about the seven questions. This can actually facilitate a conversation. So you can use some of the tactics that we talked earlier and be like, hey, it seems like there's a bit of hesitation. What's on your mind? Is there anything else? So what's the real challenge for you here? Do you know what you really want at the moment? And ideally, how can I best support you? And just to check in, I mean, if you say yes to this, then what are you saying no to? What's the most, most useful thing to you, right? You can use these to stimulate a, a conversation. And if there's a opportunity for your client to go deeper, you can use one of these three things, mirroring, labeling, clarification questions. Clarification questions I learned from Jeremy Miner. He talks about like, hey, what made you do that? What did you exactly mean by that? Why do you feel that way? Why did you say that? Can you help me walk me through how you arrived at that conclusion? I use that sometimes for a lot of my coaching calls, especially when my students make assumptions. So example, this is a lot of money. When you say a lot of money, I guess what did you mean by that exactly? Right, that's a clarification question. Labeling, it seems like there's a bit of hesitation it seems like there's a bit of concern. Mirroring, a lot of money, right? So all these statements are used to bring up a dialogue about what the real concern is. And here's a dialogue that Jeremy Miner has. That's not a problem. Like, I don't have enough money, Kevin. That's not a problem. Tell me, if you did have the funds, is this something that would actually work for you? <laughs> That's how he would say it. Why do you feel like it would though? And I can appreciate that the funds may be an issue for, from what you told me, but how do you think you can resolve it where you can actually find the funding for the right solution so that you can benefit? What other avenues do you have to find the funds so that you can benefit? Um, can, can I make a suggestion to you? That's exactly how Jeremy would do it. <laughs> have you considered doing it this way? Would that help you? How so? But how do you know when to stop with the questions? Cause like at some point it feels like 21 questions. And so there's a few points that I like to point out. You look for the energy shift, the flip. This is where they start to lean in. This is where they have an aha moment and you actually feel it. But the most important part is just to listen. The last part is proposing a solution. This is the phase where you collaborate toward a solution that benefits both parties. And the, the key of the discussion phase is really just to stay neutral and understand the core underlying problem that needs to be solved. So after your counterpart clarifies, it's important for you to use a label to summarize things up and just to let them know that you're listening. So it sounds like investing into a solution that is 5K will require discussion with your partner. So assuming that we could resolve this, what do you see as being the next possible step? Okay, so it seems like the main concern with XYZ, with the solution is XYZ. With that being said, I may have a potential solution if you're open to it. Would it help if I provide a recommendation? And this is something I learned from the catalyst. Rather than moving ahead and doing something new, uncertainty makes people wait and stick to whatever they've always been doing, at least until that uncertainty resolves, if it ever does. Right? It's easier, basically it's easier to say stuck. So how do you reduce the uncertainty? Well, there's four key ways to do that. This kind of goes into offer creation, but we can harness freemium, freemium, reduce upfront costs, drive discovery, make it reversible. So with harnessing freemium, you can do a pilot program, doing a small test before a major rollout. You can do a trial period. You can do a 100% performance-based, value-based offer where you take all the risk but collect more on the back end. I've been playing around with this a lot for agency um, owners and stuff because every agency is offering very, very similar packages and it's very commoditized. And this has been very, very helpful for me. There, you can reduce upfront costs. So there's a value-based offer. You take majority risk, but you take a higher payout upon delivery. This is different from the 100% because you, you will collect some upfront. Usually do it in three installments or however you like to structure it. There's leveraged capital where you can use funding for like a 0% APR card. 
there's payment plans you take a risk but you can collect installments and usually with payment plans since you're taking out more risk you can charge more there's a phased engagement so you pay upon different phases or key milestones okay so then there's discovery you can provide case studies you can reverse the sale so send them back to content lead magnets or other intellectual assets like meaning like wind things back if they don't trust you not a problem i mean Honestly, I wouldn't want you to work with me if you didn't trust I could do the job. I mean, would it help if I, if you went back to some of the content I've created and just make sure that this is something they actually want? Or you can have a real conversation about the consequences and let them decide the next steps. For making it reversible, you can provide a guarantee. So Alex Hermosi, who I just met not that long ago, uh, he talks about unconditional uh, conditional, unconditional guarantees where it's like money back no matter what, even if you're unhappy. Conditional is like you have to do XYZ and then we'll refund your money. Anti-guarantee, there is no guarantee. An implied guarantee as well, which is like value-based and stuff too. But the stronger your guarantee is, the more you can use it to show people how good your business is. My guarantee is so strong, don't you think I would be out of business if I didn't deliver? And then you can follow up. With that being said, are you against or opposed to doing that and getting started today. How would you like to proceed or what would you like the next steps to look like? And finally, if you get ghosted by a prospect, don't chase them down. It'll only cause more survival state. I just say something as simple as this. It looks like I haven't heard from you. I want to be mindful of your situation. So have you given up on doing XYZ? Bit of a never split the difference. Bit from my therapist because she always uses the word mindful, but it's really important. Okay, so now you know the psychology of selling, the neuroscience is selling humanizing conversations. So as we wrap up to the end, what are some elements that you really like to implement in your conversations? What's one thing and what's the top priority thing and focus on that. And so one thing I will ask when you, if you're here still is like, if you know one team or someone that would benefit from this presentation, I love an introduction. I've been doing these just out of the goodness of my heart. I don't charge for these at the moment, but um, that is something that really helps me. Anyways, please let me know what was useful for you. That is like my whole primer on this. It's like literally I started shooting at, I started shooting at 12, it's 7.30 right now, and I've spent a lot of time just shooting and resting and stuff. So I just want to say I appreciate you. If you need any help, please let me know. Take care. Peace.